call the meeting to order. Welcome to the January 28th, 2013 Owen Sound City Council meeting. As you can tell, I'm not Mayor Haswell. <laughs> really? <laughs> uh, Mayor Haswell is out of town on business and uh, the acting mayor for the month of January. I get to sit in the big chair. It's a whole different perspective up here. I would uh, ask uh, Bruce Ronald to come forward and offer a uh, faith blessing. <clears throat> Welcome, Mr. Ronald. This is a good religion if you're losing your hair. <laughs> uh, prayer for our community. Our God, the God of our spirits of all flesh, keep and bless this city of ours. Bless the leaders of this city and set in their hearts the spirit of wisdom and understanding that they might establish peace and uh, liberty for all its inhabitants. Bless all of us equally in the light of your presence and that we might build together a society in which the vision of your prophet will soon be fulfilled, building houses and living in them, planting gardens and eating their fruit, seeking the welfare of the city in which you live and pray to the eternal in its behalf. For all for in its prosperity you shall prosper. And let us say, Amen. Uh, there's been a Jewish community in Owen Sound since the late 1800s. The uh, little synagogue, which is known as the smallest little synagogue still going in a small community, is named after my wife's grandfather. And then her other grandfather was a rabbi here in the uh, late 50s, 60s, I believe. So the Jewish community's been here for a little probably longer than most people would know. Anyway, thank you and shalom. <coughs> thank you very much, Mr. Ronald. <coughs> I ask if there are any additional items for this evening. Councillor McManaman. Thank you, uh, Acting Worship. Uh, two items, one about the recent snow event and uh, some questions about uh, our policies and procedures, and also about the upcoming Good Roads Conference and uh, delegations we might um, try and, uh, or um, politicians we might try to meet with. Thank you. Councillor Chamberlain. Yes, I'd like to take a little different attack on the uh, snow from the weekend. Um, talk about the people that camped out. <coughs> Councillor Boddy. Uh, winter weather. Uh, I'd like to talk about another event, second event that will be coming to our harbor this summer. No one else on council staff? Thank you, Councillor Twaddle. I have an item that was emailed to council today and placed on your desk uh, this evening from Mr. Ron Peary. Any other? Items of additional business. <coughs> Thank you. Resolution confirming the minutes of January the 14th. Moved by <coughs> Councillor um, myself and seconded by Councillor Wright that the minutes of the regular meeting of City Council held on January 14th, 2013, as printed, be adopted. All in favor? It's carried. Sorry, uh, it's been pointed out to me that I missed the uh, disclosure of pecuniary interest. Anyone have a disclosure of pecuniary interest? I would be declaring a pecuniary interest with regards to one item in the uh, bylaw minutes this evening with regards to um, a, a recommendation to provide free parking to volunteers working for a not-for-profit organization. Uh, as I am employed by a, one of eight or nine other charitable and not-for-profit organizations in the downtown who I expect will be seeking the same treatment. Resolution to move uh, council into Committee of the Whole. Moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Wright, that the City Council now go into Committee of the Whole to consider public meetings, deputations, public question period, <laughs> matters arising from correspondence, reports, matters tabled, 
motions for which notice was previously given and other business. All in favor? That's carried unanimously. Thank you. We're now in <coughs> committee. Well, the first item is uh, deputation by Kim Allerton of uh, Northwood and Associates Landscape Architects regarding the uh, downtown riverfront uh, design study. Welcome, Ms. Allerton. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you for, uh, for hearing me this evening. I'm really pleased to be here uh, to address all of you. And I just need to get the right presentation up and we'll be off and running. I was retained by the city to, uh, to study the downtown precinct uh, late last summer. If we could have another bank or two, please. The photos are kind of important, I think. Thank you. Uh, I was retained by the city to uh, look at the River Precinct uh, in downtown Owen Sound. Um, usually when I give this presentation, I have shown a beautiful picture of the river itself, but tonight I thought I'd change it up a little bit for those who've seen this before, and I've uh, added some new photographs, different photographs of different parts of the River Precinct. Um, I'm sure most of you are familiar with the project area and goals, but I will just review them again. Uh, the, the, all of the drawings that we'll be looking at tonight are, are turned so that north is to the left of the, uh, of the screen, so just so that we're orienting uh, all looking the same way. The harbor is to the left, therefore the mill dam off the screen to the right, and the project area is outlined in red. The project goals were to use an urban design approach, keeping in mind the harbor and downtown master plan that was prepared in 2001 by Huff Woodland Naylor, to develop a conceptual and schematic design for that downtown or for the downtown river precinct in Owen Sound. The goal is also to improve the character, make this area inviting, inclusive to all people, strengthen the image and identity of the downtown, and of course to embrace and highlight the natural environment that is the river that runs right through this space, the Sydenham River. Within the, the project area, or right on the edges of it, of course, we have City Hall, the Farmer's Market Building, Library, and the Tom Thompson Art Gallery, four very important civic uh, functions and buildings that, uh, that are um, really right within this space. As part of the project, there was an extensive information gathering process uh, over a fairly short period of time in September and October. And I met with, um, with many uh, individuals and representatives of groups and, and agencies one-on-one, -on -one, telephone conversations, uh, and, uh, and, and, um, and actually interviews just on the street. Uh, uh, Pam Coulter and I did some, uh, some nabbing of people, uh, just grabbing them and asking questions, not literally grabbing them, but, but pulling aside people in the downtown area and in the, in the uh, river precinct to get their input and interest, people who might not otherwise uh, come to a meeting or be represented in, in an, any other way. So we took um, all of that information into account as well as, uh, as the information that was gathered at the November 5th public meeting that was held at this uh, location. There were 41 uh, people present at that meeting. Because I know there were people that didn't sign this, this, the sign-in sheet, so we had at least 41 people, which is a really great uh, turnout in my experience. Anyway, this project has uh, has stirred up a lot of interest, and I've had a lot of people uh, send me direct emails, uh, written comments, and uh, and call me up and uh, separate from from my uh, seeking out their uh, responses. Uh, it's, it's really an area that's very close to the heart of Owen Sounders and people from uh, outside of the city as well. The November 5th meeting, I tried to, uh, to hold it as very much as an open conversation as opposed to me saying what I thought, uh, what I thought this, um, the River Precinct should be. And we had, um, we had an, an existing air photo and people were invited to uh, uh, attach stickies, sticky notes with their ideas, and we got some great input and ideas from that. Things, uh, outdoor theater, more seating, 
um, uh, areas where it's a great view, please bury the cables. I can't stand the overhead wires. Uh, and how about let's move this road over, over a little bit, and that sort of thing. And a lot of really positive response came out of that. I've summarized, and I'm not going to go through all of these, uh, these notes in detail, but there were a lot of comments related to uh, all kinds of aspects uh, of this river precinct. Uh, one or two related to parking. Uh, certain parts of the area are very important that we don't eliminate parking and other areas where people said, yes, please take away some parking because the walkway is too narrow. Uh, there are a lot of problems and issues were identified and I've, uh, have things from not enough trash receptacles to, boy, I really don't like those fences at the Festival of Northern Lights. I love the lights, but the fences are, are a real problem for some individuals. Uh, a lot of people commented on the aesthetics. <coughs> related to that. And there were a lot of great suggestions. You'll notice the right-hand column is much longer than the, than the column on the left. So lots of great suggestions about what we should do. And I've tried to incorporate as many as seemed appropriate um, into, the, into the design. So um, the preliminary concept, uh, I did present a preliminary concept ideas at the November 5th meeting, and it was refined as a result of that meeting. And I'm going to go through it briefly now. Uh, the concept that, um, that has evolved. First and foremost, that there be a continuous riverside trail leaking the harbor on the left-hand side of the screen to the mill dam on the right. Now, both of those are outside of the project area, but that linking pathway needs to go right through the river precinct area. Secondly, that the Percy England Parkette next to City Hall be extended in it the, the surface treatment and the character of the space right through to the top of the river bank. What follows along uh, the same lines then is to develop a promenade along the top of the river bank on the east side in the 800 block. At the north end of that stretch that six or seven parking spaces be removed to create a comfortable place for all people to gather and congregate. This is a real meeting place in the community, and it, it, right now it has very few facilities to, to accommodate the activities that are taking place there. First Avenue East, north and south of 8th Street, we're recommending that they be realigned away from the riverbank. You'll see the blue line on, that, uh, on the uh, screen there. Uh, north of 8th Street is actually on the east side of the market building, and south of 8th Street is pulled away from the river bank, which would necessitate that the uh, bicycle park be actually shifted westward towards the, uh, the river. Um, that particular uh, change received a lot of positive comments from the public. Uh, that there be um, a market square created on the west side of the market building with a focus to the river, focusing on the river. And that the area on the other side of the market, between the city hall and market, be developed as a, uh, further developed as a civic square for multi-purpose uh, special events and of course keeping the parking function weekdays when it's needed. But it's already being used in that way at certain times, and, and the uh, landscape could better reflect that and, uh, and be a more attractive uh, location and space. The uh, yellow rectangles represent in conceptual form landings for short-term boat tie-up and launching canoes and kayaks right down at the river level in various locations. The existing paths should be strengthened and more walkways, trails, and nodes, that is sort of uh, meeting places, be created and augmented uh, in, in the river precinct. The area in the 900 block west side, there, uh, there's sort of a stone feature there that no one is quite sure or re is willing to own up to. <laughs> how it came about. But I think there are great features uh, or aspects of that feature. It just needs some adjustment. We need to remove the visual barriers, the overgrown shrubs, and, uh, and make the, um, the railings more, uh, more transparent. Trees, benches, tables could be add to, added to that space as well as a possible food concession and canoe and kayak rental concession. 
In the 800 block on the west side, adding more art, temporary art installations, and a storytelling circle. South of 8th Street and the Jervis Bay Park, uh, developed that as a, a children or a family-oriented park with a nautical theme that draws uh, uh, and, and uh, celebrates the, uh, the nautical history, particularly the merchant marine history uh, of the city. And then finally, in the 900 block east side, develop what the Harbor and Downtown Master Plan proposed as the River Works, a pedestrian district with restricted vehicular access and limited parking that would really uh, become a shopping district where the caf there might be cafes and the doors open to the backs of the shops uh, and patios and seating and, and overlooks over the river. All told, there will be, and, it could, and there actually currently are, lots of reasons to be in this space. And I see that my little notes are not showing up on your computer. <laughs> but believe me, there was picnicking and walking and cycling and history and cultural <laughs> events. And this is why I knew I should always use my own computer. I've got, given you in your handout a list of those items. I think there are 24. Art, storytelling, <clears throat> drama, dance, theater, the market, the art crawl, um, fishing, cycling, walking, how am I doing? I think there are all kinds of uh, 24 or so reasons to be there. Ceremony and culture, children's play, viewing, relaxing, meeting friends. And thank you, Pam. The Festival of Northern Lights, I would suggest, strongly suggest that the focus of the festival, and the festival is a wonderful thing, uh, and it really has, has uh, I was at the opening event this year and it was, it was quite a spectacular opening event. The fireworks in the trees uh, in, in, along the river was, was quite something. And to see the number of people there enjoying that event was really something. It was, it was quite spectacular. Uh, but I have um, uh, heard from many people though that they think that uh, it would be so much better if the fences didn't block the, the part of the park in the downtown that they are currently blocking for about two, two and a half months of the year. And, and so what I recommend is that the focus of, of the festival in the downtown core, anyway, be changed from ground level events to those that are up in the air, up in the trees, lighting the buildings, uh, and that would allow the, uh, the ground level, the parks themselves, the riverbanks, to still be used uh, by the public in the way that, that so many of us like to use them all year round. And there are lots of examples of really spectacular light displays uh, that, that, that don't require protection uh, from vandals. And, and I understand um, the, the reasons why the fences are there now because of the nature of the displays in the downtown. Uh, so ja overall, the conceptual design for the downtown re river precinct evolved in this manner, and it is very much a conceptual design. And I, I want to say too, in your handouts, I noticed today that actually the um, the photograph underlying air photo got shifted, <laughs> and so all of the concept drawings are slightly off in in your handout. So uh, just in your mind, realign them <laughs> when you're looking at that handout. We'll make sure that you have a corrected version at the end of this. That conceptual design evolved into a schematic design drawing, more representational of what these concepts might actually look like on the ground. And I want to emphasize that this is very much a schematic design, a sort of a first uh, shot at, at what the, the uh, concepts might be, but not to be taken literally. There are lots of different ways that, that those can, um, the ideas can be represented in, in, um, on the ground. Um, this is, as I say, a, a first go at that. So generally speaking, I, uh, I want to talk about some of the big uh, changes first and just give some uh, essence of what they might uh, appear or what they might look like through the use of photographs. So the walkways, which really are end-to-end -end on this, uh, the river precinct, uh, might look 
uh, like this, where the walkways are going under the bridges, uh, particularly the, uh, the Ninth Street Bridge at this point. Uh, the, it's a little more difficult to get under the Eighth and Tenth Street bridges. Uh, but I think the, the use of uh, trees to define the space and to create um, the canopy and, the, and, uh, and shade are very important. And the photo on the lower left especially demonstrates that. Uh, some more images of what the pathways might look like. And there will be a hierarchy of pathways from the main trail to, uh, to lesser, uh, uh, those trails of lesser, uh, lesser width and um, more of a secondary nature down closer to the riverbank, not right at the river. It's important that we maintain uh, a vegetated buffer. Uh, the, what the landings might look like, and, and I know there will be challenges related to the landings because the, the river uh, and the, the lake level does fluctuate, but it's uh, not something that hasn't been done before. It's all possible. There are some images he here of uh, canoe racks and kayaks uh, using um, river, and this is the sort of thing that I'm envisioning for the downtown. So more specifically, in the, the southern part of the precinct, that is the, uh, just the very north end of the 700 block and the 800 block, there are some unique features um, that, uh, and I want to show you some images of what I'm envisioning there. The promenade itself on the east side, I believe should be a wide, uh, pedestrian realm, mostly hard surface because of the intensity of use, but with uh, tree plantings and a lot of tables and benches uh, and, and information kiosks and games tables uh, so that it's uh, an area that's welcoming for all people and there's lots of space and lots of options for routes within, uh, for traveling <coughs> through the space so that it's not just a single path, um, but that there are um, lots of activities and options. There should be uh, benches that, uh, that take advantage of the view, and in some in sun, and some in, in shade, and sheltered from the wind. Uh, and there are, again, there are lots of examples of, of ways to, we can achieve that, um, that kind of a space. The market. Market already is really quite a wonderful thing. Uh, and this plan, uh, of course, would sort of change the orientation a little bit directing it more westward as opposed to the, uh, eastward, uh, with some um, lots of opportunities for stalls uh, within, of course, the canopy that's there now, as well as uh, additional canopy to, on the river side. Um, lots of performance space, performance possibilities. And again, I'm, I'm throwing in a few photos from, uh, from Owen Sound in a lot of these uh, slides so that you can um, appreciate that we're, we're, we're already kind of going in the right direction. We just need to, uh, to uh, really build on, on what's happening already. Storytelling circle, some great possibilities here. And the library was very ex uh, excited about this, uh, this idea of creating a storytelling space in the, in the Queen's Park right across the road from the library building itself. And again, lots of different ways we can create the space, but the opportunities for, uh, for activities uh, and events in that uh, kind of a space are, are really um, pretty exciting. Uh, lots of different ways that art can be represented in, uh, in, in the Queens, Queens Park, the 800 block uh, west side in particular, but also throughout this, the, uh, the entire river precinct, as it should be throughout the whole uh, downtown, too. Some, some images just for inspiration about what Jervis Bay Park might be, with a, a little bit of a playful attitude, but also uh, respectful of, of uh, the naming and the, of the park itself, the Jervis Bay, and, uh, and that connection with the Merchant Marine uh, during the war. In the north, uh, part of, uh, of the river precinct, there are some other uh, unique uh, possibilities, particularly related to the river works and some examples of, of other municipalities where the backs of, of, uh, of uh, commercial buildings have been opened up and, uh, and um, that area used also as a pedestrian realm of a, a little more upscale than, uh, than what we're looking at now for that section. 
uh, some great images of, of the, the kind of nooks and, uh, and architectural detailing that, that can be uh, celebrated rather than uh, turning our backs on. Uh, the, a possibility was, um, was suggested and also in the Harbor and Downtown Master Plan of actually creating a link between 2nd Avenue East and the river uh, in that 900 block. Um, and, as was, uh, and this was brought up at both of our public meetings on this project. And, and my response at the time as the, to the question of why I hadn't actually shown that on the plan was that I was a little bit hesitant to actually draw a line through anybody's building in particular. But I think that the idea is a wonderful one if the opportunity should come up. And maybe it can actually happen through a store, you know, through if, if we get the stores to open up uh, to their, their back entrance, not necessarily like Allen's Alley here in this, um, this image, but uh, it could just be uh, encouraging movement through the stores to a more transparent back wall. Uh, street vendors. Uh, we already have one or two in Owen Sound, and of course there used to be another one right in the, the heart of the River Precinct at the corner of Knight's, uh, Knight Street and the river, but uh, is not there any longer. But there are uh, we're suggesting that um, that uh, that 900 block, this, the west side, would be a great location for uh, for street vendors. It, it could also, of course, like the homemade or the homemade ice cream cart here on the right. It could be um, it doesn't have to be fixed in one location, but should be encouraged. That's something that that again really draws people to an area. Um, so at the uh, December 3rd public meeting where I presented uh, this more refined concept and the schematic design, we also, we had about 25 plus people in attendance. It was held in the uh, basement auditorium at the library. And again, we had uh, some great comments, um, not just with stick-ons, uh, sticky notes onto the plan, but, uh, but a great discussion that followed my presentation. Um, there were some, um, you'll see here from these stick-ons, uh, that there was a bridge has been suggested in a pedestrian bridge across the river in the 900 block. Uh, and we've got uh, the other notes, and I'll just read some of them for you. On the Tim Hortons, it says, please get rid of the drive-through and the truck parking and somebody else put in there, I agree. Um, there's a note at the upper left says that the uh, street should be made uh, cobblestone uh, to encourage pedestrian traffic. And, um, and then on the, whoops, pardon me here, push the wrong button. And in the uh, south end of the site, we had, um, we've got two notes there that say, I love the new street alignment. Uh, the, this move's a great idea. Another note saying that the three pedestrian crossings on 8th Street are a great idea, will help to traffic, to calm the traffic and slow uh, people down. A number of people wanted the the walkway to go under the 8th Street Bridge. So you can see there, there's sort of like a little uh, clover leaf there for a bike trail that was suggested from 8th Street to go right underneath the, um, the 8th Street Bridge. Uh, and I just want to say that I did consider that, and I think that um, it isn't shown in our final plan because I think it's a bit over, uh, it, I'm not sure if I want to use the word overkill, but. My intention is that 8th Street be more, become more of a pedestrian realm, or at least a more comfortable place for pedestrians through the use of traffic calming measures as the, uh, the crosswalks and some of the other things that would happen here just because of the realignment of First Avenue uh, East, that it would not be so daunting to actually cross it on a, psych on a bike uh, and on foot. And because of the arch of 8th Street, bridge, it actually would be quite difficult to get a walkway underneath there. It would have to be really out, suspended out quite a bit out into the river. And I would hate to, uh, to mess with, as it were, the aesthetics of that bridge. I think it's really quite something just the way it is. But um, anyway, the lots of comments and a generally a very positive response to the concept and the schematic plans. Now I've put this slide in to remind me to talk about, um, about lighting in general uh, and that it does need to be considered and we need to, uh, we need to make sure that, uh, that the, the, uh, the area not only is safe but also feels safe. And I'm not talking about lighting it in an extreme way but in, in a way that is uh, creating interesting 
pools of light that uh, where people feel comfortable and, and uh, not that somebody is lurking or hiding in, uh, in areas that are un, uh, unseen. I know that one of the things that has been raised in many of my discussions with not all of the people I've talked to, but a number of them, is the, um, the way that uh, parts of this space are being currently used and sort of as, as a hangout and that there's a lot of people gathering and some people feel intimidated. And I think that um, one of the things that, well, this quote here, I'm just going to read it, that, that often, well, so-called undesirables are not the problem. It's the measures taken to combat them that are the problem. The best way to handle the problem of undesirables uh, is to make the place attractive to everyone else so that it becomes an area that's used by everyone and not just an isolated few. And this isn't something that I made up. William White is a very well-renowned uh, urban designer and architect uh, and has been practicing for years and years. He was held in high re regard when I was at university, so that's ages ago. Um, and has written many books on the subjects. When we, when we, um, when we take a, a sort of a combative response, uh, it, it makes things worse. It's a downward, creates a downward spiral. The other thing I want to just uh, mention is the crime prevention through environmental design or SEPTED principles, uh, the underlying principles. And I've been keeping these in mind as I've developed the concept and the schematic design. Underlying concepts are making sure that we create natural surveillance, that we're removing visual obstacles, that there are eyes on the street, so that, so that would-be criminals don't feel that they, can, they can't be seen. Natural access control, denying those who might do uh, illegal activities access to potential targets, uh, you know, uh, just and, and that's a difficult one to describe in the case in the in the context of public parks because of course they're not necessarily targets themselves. Uh, so it doesn't necessarily really apply in this case. But also territorial reinforcement so that we clearly define what is public space and what is private space. The other two things that we need to keep in mind when we're talking about SEPTED is good maintenance helps to deter offenders. In other words, when places look well looked after and are well looked after, people feel that there's a, there's a sense of ownership and somebody cares about this place, it's less likely to be vandalized. And that the more positive use we can uh, encourage, the less negative use there will be. That's well known. And uh, sort of as a general uh, statement here, I'd like to uh, emphasize that we want to avoid landscaping that creates blind spots or hiding places. That's why I'm recommending that most of the shrubs, those big shrub beds, be removed from along the top of the river bank and in, on the west side in the 900 block and that we open up those railings so that you can't, that you can see everything, that it's legible and understandable and before you enter into a space you know who's in that space and if you want to avoid them there are ways, lots of alternate uh, paths and routes to take. Um, and so uh, I also want to just bring up that question that I did at both of our previous public meetings and asking it of you to think about what's the difference between loitering and lingering. And I'm not going to say what the answer is. I don't know if there is an answer that's an easy answer. But uh, perhaps a lot of that uh, is all about perception and who we are compared with, you know, maybe it was just that we don't know the people that are in a particular space. Uh, but the images here that I'm showing are of people lingering, I would say. And one of them is, uh, is in Owen Sound. So um, the photograph on the lower right is actually from an article uh, that I was uh, encountered in my research that was actually called In Defense of Loitering. <laughs> Uh, and it pointed out that in a space where there are a, a wide mix of people, that, uh, that all of a sudden it doesn't feel 
so intimidating. And, and the, uh, the writer of the article pointed out the, the, the fellow in the left bench there and how he's all covered in tattoos and bare shirted and so on. But uh, in, in the words of the writer, uh, he's sitting next to some pretty classy ladies in skirts. So, you know, it all, uh, they're all quite comfortable there together, apparently. Of course, I don't know who took the picture and why, but anyway. Um, finally, I would like to suggest some priorities for the implementation. And first and foremost, and I think this is in many ways kind of low-hanging fruit, easily, more easily done than others, is to remove those visual and physical obstacles, that is, the overgrown shrubs and parking in select locations, realign some curves, curbs, uh, take over, take back some of those, the street that has been uh, taken over by vehicles over the years, back for the pedestrian, plant some trees for shade and spatial definitions. And the areas that I've highlighted on the, on the plan with, uh, with the number one generally are, are uh, areas where that first priority could be uh, relatively easily uh, undertaken. Secondly, I think that uh, developing those continuous walkways and landings along the river on the west side of, uh, makes, makes sense. And not that it's, it's, well, it is important, but it's also a little easier uh, piece to bite off than what I've I, itemized here as number three, and that is reconstructing First Avenue on the east side of the river. The seven and 800, or the north half of part of the 700 block and 800 block and then tackling the 900 block. Suggested priorities. Other things may come into the mix to, uh, to change uh, how that actually unfolds, but um, that's where I'm at at this point. And thus ends my presentation for tonight. I thank you for your time, and <coughs> I would be pleased to entertain any questions you might have. Thank you very much. Ms. Albert, not, um, <clears throat> I had an opportunity to be at the public meetings and certainly uh, I think that um, you engaged very well or the community engaged very well with you and there was lots of enthusiasm uh, and lots of positive comment and as you pointed out, very little negative comment and I think that's, I think that's really important. There's been a lot of enthusiasm for that. Any uh, questions or comments? Councillor Wright. Thank you very much, and thank you very much for the presentation. And and I I, ha I did attend the, the meetings, but I didn't ask questions because I felt that was for the public. However, I've never heard yet whether or not the road that you want to reconfigure behind City Hall is going to be a one-way street. No, and I I hadn't thought it would be. I'm not a traffic engineer. Um, and I know that has uh, come up as a suggestion and a question. Uh, I don't think it needs to be, but the plan would, from an urban design point of view, work equally well, I believe, with it one way or two way. Okay, so that would lead into my second question is, at our market on Saturday morning, you, you realize that there are stalls on both sides of the... Yes. And you talk about sort of moving that. Where do you expect the the people that have the stalls to do their parking to unload and load up? I would expect that, uh, that the whole market square on the, uh, on the west side of the market canopy could be accessible to vehicles at that time. Ah, oh, I see. So it's that orange section there towards the river? towards the river could be open. You notice that there's a little gap between the market building itself and there's a row of three trees there, that that could be uh, an area where, uh, where vehicles could come in and potentially at certain times of, uh, of the day or week, it, they might even just be used for parking in that area too if, if you needed it for certain events or... Um, so it's a really, it's a also a multi-purpose space, but those, those five little yellowish tri uh, squares, I envision them being uh, a more permanent type of canopy as well for market stalls, but that you'd be able to, you know, vehicles could be able to get in and, and around on, on all sides of those as well. It might be that, uh, that there are vehicles in that center area and so that people using the market would, you know, go under the canopy and then under the, uh, the square 
you know, that, that angled row of, of uh, five squares as well. So that it's kind of like an extension of the canopy, in, but in a slightly different um, uh, form. I, I just, it is, First Avenue is a one-way street from 10th Street through to 9th Street. That's a, that's a one way. Yes, it is. And I personally, I think it should continue right straight along till it comes out on, on uh, at 7th Street. I think that is a perfect one way street moving traffic and it would be a lot safer for the Tim Hortons drive in there too because that is a real bottleneck. It very much is. So yes. I think uh, that that's something that needs further study but I have no, uh, I would have no objection at all to that. A number of people uh, suggested actually that First Avenue East be be blocked to through traffic on Saturday mornings. Not necessarily all the way through but certainly that south end that, uh, that the market could actually extend uh, in a pedestrian way from City Hall right through to the river without having traffic moving through there on a Saturday morning anyway. And, and that probably would be a safer... I would agree with the, that it would be safer, yes. yes thank you. <coughs> Councillor Lemon. A very, very good report and I'm very pleased you talked about getting a, uh, rid of some of the blocks to looking at the river. And if you carry that farther north, particularly, well, along the west uh, harbor, a large amount of the harbor cannot be seen by people because there's so much growth. We, those nice little trees that were great when they were three feet tall now are quite large with branching up and there's about a block and a half there where you cannot, see, you don't know the harbor's there because of the forest. And I think, I love trees and I like plants as you well know, but you can get carried away. And I think in some cases in the areas you specify, we have gotten carried away and we lose any vision of what's there. It, instead of being an enhancement, it becomes a blockage to view. And so I think I applaud you for that part of your report. Councillor Purden and then Councillor Dear. Yes, I, I really like this report and I think the thing I like the most about it is how engaged people were at the consultations and just everybody who looks at it. I think uh, people in Olin Sand are really proud of that area and just want to see good things happen there. So. It's a great blueprint, and I think it's a blueprint that's just going to bring people together. I, I'm hoping if there's people listening out there, they might like to think of how their company or their organization might come forward to help realize a plan like this, because certainly for the city, we're going to need partners, and uh, this is a plan, I think, where there's lots of possibility. In particular, I like the uh, opportunities for people to be able to walk and cycle and and canoe, uh, we have a canoe and we've canoed down lots of times and it would be so great to have a staging area in the downtown where you could actually get out of the canoe and uh, walk around or do things and uh, it's, a, it's a great plan. So thanks for getting it all together for us. Thank you very much. It's been a real enjoy, really an enjoyable uh, experience. Uh, and I felt the same kind of energy and enthusiasm from the public. Councillor Dare. Thank you, Councillor Twell. Um, <coughs> um, Mrs. Allerton, I, I, I'm very excited about this, and part of the reason is um, how well you sort of guided the public through the two, the two public meetings. I was able to fortunately attend both of those meetings, and um, I haven't seen crowds like that out to anything short of a cat bylaw. <laughs> so you're to be commended for the, the excitement that um, you were able to generate. And, and the comments back. Um, this is perhaps more um, more to staff. Is so. Where do we go from from here? We have this vision at our last um, budget meeting. We did put some funds in to finish the sidewalk from the Banshell to um, to Ninth Street. But there's a lot of really interesting things here. Um, so what you know from uh, from a corporate perspective what's what's our next step through you mr. chairman um, 
certainly we have had a fulsome public process that was um, laid out by council and, and certainly Kim has carried that off in a way that has reflected the public um, vision, I think, in the design that she's presented uh, for council tonight. And um, I would ask that council consider a recommendation that the um, that you approve the plan as presented and consider and that the plan be considered an addendum to the city's downtown and harbor front master plan and that gives it status in our official plan as we consider um, and do work in our downtown that you know as we consider projects that um, that they would be consistent with the design uh, that's in that downtown and harbor front master plan well in fact then that's what i would like to do um, is create this as an addendum to the, the downtown harbor master plan. I think we, there's a lot here to digest, but I think we need to make, give it some sort of official, um, you know, capacity and, and begin to work on, on this. Obviously, as we get down further, there's detailed design work. These are sort of the broad, the broad strokes, so strokes. to speak, and we need to get down um, to the nitty gritty. And I, I'm glad that you've sort of prioritized some of that. I think that will help us as we move. Um, move forward. We'll, you know, deal with the, the small things first, and leave it to some other council to spend the the big uh, the big <laughs> dollars. But uh, I, I think it would be great to get this to get started. Thank you, Councillor Adair. Ms. Coulter. Uh, in addition, it may be appropriate for council to refer sort of the implementation and the. Um, you know, consideration of this in more detail in terms of what is the first phase through our Community Planning and Heritage Advisory Committee. So if, if that <coughs> could be part of the uh, motion to approve it in principle. Absolutely. You make that part of the motion. We have a motion on the floor. Councillor Boddy. Quick question, if I, if I may. Thank you. Uh, we received letters uh, from um, somebody that's interested in property in the area. That will be included at some point, uh, his suggestions. Um, that's a question, I guess. Or how, how, will we, uh, how will we look at his suggestions? Um, <clears throat> I, I think at this point, I would withdraw that additional item tonight and bring forward some information on how we would address that. But I certainly have some thoughts on how we would do that. So that's sort of impl implementation stage, et cetera. OK, good. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Motion. Any other comments or questions? All in favor? That's carried unanimously. Thank you, Ms. Allerton. That's a, a, a great plan. I think lots of community involvement. Uh, the next part of your challenge is now tell us where the money comes from. I too. But um, certainly, certainly appreciate that, that you've um, made some recommendations in stages and that we can I always talk about how do you eat the elephant one one bite at a time and and again this has come forward in a way that we can we can do this with the vision in mind and do it in stages and and hopefully make it affordable thank you very much You're welcome. <coughs> our next presentation is uh, one world festival Joe Calvert and uh, and Donald Donald Anderson <coughs> Donald assured me that's not his security blanket he's carrying <laughs> is good. Wow, so um, actually how excited am I that we're following that awesome presentation because this just is such a, a, a great opportunity for that conversation to, uh, to keep going. Um, so my name is Jackie and Donald's here with me tonight and we sit on the committee that helps to plan the Grey Bruce One World Festival um, which celebrates diversity. So exactly what uh, that whole presentation was about. Um, the initial group was started out of the Grey Bruce Violence Prevention Coordinating Committee and we created a, a smaller subgroup called the Inclusive Communities Committee. 
Um, this committee began working way back in 2005 um, to address racism and discrimination and build a more inclusive Grey Bruce, which is so important these days. And um, originally there was two Weaving Our Community conferences held um, up at the Outdoor Education Centre and, um, and then there's been workshops out and about to um, build capacities within the workplace to create that more inclusive community of, of Grey Bruce and Owen Sound. Um, the Grey Bruce One World Festival um, is to build respectful relationships and foster the development of our wonderful inclusive community. Um, and the first year, we really um, um, promoted it as a month-long celebration um, with the festival being that really big yahoo at the end. Um, so the objectives of the One World Festival is to engage those diverse groups that we have in our community and give them more of a spotlight. Um, and as well, to, um, to, again, always about dialogue, get people talking, um, build skills and capacity, and just celebrate this area that we have. So the very first year, that was our, our wonderful 2011 event. Um, it was really fantastic. There was a lot of folks, anybody who came down, there was a lot of school children, um, a lot of different booths. We filled up the whole market um, with lots of different booths for people to, uh, and, and you can see there on the calendar, we did succeed at getting quite a few different um, events throughout the month. Um, last year, um, it was again held at the same time. That was my birthday. And uh, so it was kind of nice to have a big party for my birthday. And uh, again, it was music and, and dance and performances. And again, the, the downtown, um, which will be formally known as the, uh, in that plan there, the uh, multi-perfect purpose civic square um, was full of music, dance, and performances. So how great was that? It wasn't just a parking lot for the day. And then this is the poster for this year. So the One World Festival, again, will um, take place, um, but on the 24th of May, and then in the evening with a concert at the Roxy Theatre, so that after work crowd can, uh, can have a place to go and celebrate as well. So the outcomes, again, are um, to celebrate our diversity, but also to recognize further diversity within our community. We have a website that you can follow up um, new things to the to the festival. We have an online calendar, and of course, we link with the wonderful Concordia Multicultural Festival because they've been doing this for a lot of years. So um, between 2011 and 2012, I think it's easily said that we doubled the uh, attendance to the festival. It was packed. Did anybody get a chance to come outside the back of the building and see all those kids running around? Um, again, the biggest group was the elementary children. It was such. Um, to see them all there just showed that the, for the teachers to bring those kids down, it was a really special event for them. Um, there was over 20 displays um, from different groups within the community. Um, and then, of course, the music and the dance, the poetry, the presentations, the drama were, were just so fantastic. Um, there was lots and lots of kids' activities. Donald has, uh, has the outcome of one of those activities. Um, the Grey Highland students um, at the uh, home ec do these wonderful quilts every year and so we uh, borrowed um, one of those quilts and the children who attended the first year got to write their names on it and uh, peace symbols and happy happy faces and and so just things like that just added to the whole day plus they it's something we can keep keep showing year to year so the immeasurable outcomes are again the dialogue that takes place and the learning that takes place and the celebration of what what is Grey Bruce and Owen Sound and again year after year please do this again please do this again so that always keeps us going so here's just some pictures all those things you can't measure so there's dance lots and lots of music lots and lots of conversations about diversity and again, all those conversations about diversity, including the, the, the children, which is so important. Community engagement, like we talk about all the different partners coming together. And it wouldn't be a presentation without a picture of the puppets. <gasps> Just saying. So, and that wonderful enthusiasm that everybody brings to the event. So this year for 2013, uh, May 24th is the date we're asking for, or that we've planned for. Um, the festival will be just during the day, 9.30 to 3.30, again, to allow those schools and uh, children to attend, and any families who are available. Um, we have a, an evening concert planned um, for that after work crowd, and again, you can follow everything on that wonderful website. So we're here tonight to make some formal requests of the City Council. Um, 
so we respectfully request that um, the City Council support the aim and activities of the event itself and the committee. Um, allow the committee to hold our festival on your property again, behind City Hall in the parking lot, formerly to be known as the Civic Square, and, um, and the parking lot beside the Farmer's Market. Allow for us to um, put up a tent, because it never fails, there's always rain. Oh, goodness me. And to waive the building um, permit fee associated with that. And then just to support the event in those other ways, helping with the garbage cleanup. We got some wonderful picnic tables last year, um, you know, um, making sure you guys found somewhere else to park for the day. And then as well, again, just helping to publicize the event. Um, it wouldn't be anything if we didn't have uh, community supporters. So again, it's so exciting that we follow uh, Kim's presentation because it is the community that makes this happen and there they all are. Our teachers are there, um, businesses, there's the city of Owen Sound. Um, again, our wonderful media who was out talking to Kim, um, they all help us make it happen. And then as far as community partners, the event itself um, is a group of people making it happen. It's not just one person, it's all sorts of um, representation from our community. And then the biggest uh, thank you of all goes to the people who bring their, their diversity to the festival and the people that come to see that. So without that, it wouldn't be a festival, would it? So going forward, um, this is where we wave to the happy cameras. Hi, cameras. And we just say we always need more members from the community to come along. Um, we need people to not only just come to the event, but to also come to the event to talk about diversity and, and showcase um, our differences. Um, always, we always need more performers. Um, money is never a bad thing. And, um, and then again, just overall support from the community. So how do we create that positive, respectful community where every person feels and is valued for their differences? Um, again, that's why it's so exciting to follow Kim. Isn't that just, we couldn't have planned that better. But really, it's all about the positive, right? Just like she said. Um, so we need to be more comfortable with the uncomfortable and less comfortable with the too comfortable. And the greatest enemy to human potential is your comfort zone. So um, just an equal. I'm not different from you. I'm different like you. And again, what a great uh, concept drawings to think of what 2014 could be in spaces like that. So, um, so thank you very much for your uh, for for listening and enjoying those pictures, and uh, and uh, thank you for your time. Thanks very much, Jackie. Are there any comments or questions, Councillor McManaman? Thank you, Councillor Twaddle. Um, that's two presentations with very enthusiastic people. So, <coughs> Jackie, thanks for your enthusiasm. Probably, uh, probably the proper way to uh, <coughs> address some of the questions is ask for a staff report on this uh, on this event. I think that's how we usually would do it. So, I would move we ask for a staff uh, report on the. I, I suppose we could say a proven principle and ask for a staff report back on the uh, the issues in, <coughs> in the presentation. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? <coughs> Councillor Levin. Well, that was the second excellent presentation, and I really appreciate your enthusiasm. And uh, hopefully, we'll get the staff report back fairly quickly and be able to act on it. And I think it's the kind of event we want in the downtown, and we want in the community. And uh, I just think it's great. Uh, a lemon bucket. <laughs> you caught that, did you? Yeah, I caught that the first time. And because uh, there actually was a band many, many years ago, uh, Bashful Bill Lemon and the Bonny Beach Orchestra or something like that. That was like 100 years ago, but there was one. Well, we, obviously, they couldn't make it this year, but um, the Lemon Bucket <laughs> Orchestra can. So we're excited about that. <laughs> Any other comments or questions? We have a motion to uh, refer these requests for staff report. All in favor? That's carried unanimously. Jackie, thank you very much. Uh, again, as, as was mentioned, an enthusiastic uh, presentation, but uh, I think that the, uh, the festival has, has grown and it's certainly become an important piece of the activity that happens in the downtown, and, and uh, congratulations on the Thank you. you. And guys. just while you all have your blackberries, you're going to open them up and put May 24th in there as the <laughs> date. Okay. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you.
Thank you, Donald. <laughs> We're not public question period. I ask if there are any members of the public who would like to ask a question of council. Seeing none, we're at uh, reports of committees and staff. The first item is the consent agenda. Uh, the consent agenda is a number of generally routine items that come forward that need council approval. Uh, tonight there was one uh, report on a road hockey tournament on the 18th of February. There are several planning notices from neighboring municipalities that council just needs to be formally aware of. And there are five business licenses, four new businesses, and uh, one change of ownership. And uh, it's kind of nice uh, in January to, s to see this kind of new business activity taking place. Uh, Councillor Boddy? I will move the consent agenda. Thank you. Any comments or questions? All in favor? <laughs> That's carried. Thank you. Uh, we now have a verbal report and <coughs> PowerPoint presentation from the city manager. Thank you very much. It's always tough to be the third one and not be quite as enthusiastic as the first two. But boy, I'm really going to wrap it up, so pay attention here. So 2012 accomplishments. Boy, did we have a great year. <coughs> I am just going to wow you with what you did last year. So I'm going to talk about the Regional Recreation Center, policies, plans, new initiatives, et cetera, et cetera. So let's start with probably the greatest achievement that you could have in one year, which was the grand opening of the Julie MacArthur Regional Recreation Center. What a fabulous achievement this was, Council. Congratulate yourselves for having the perseverance and the foresight to see this to a very successful conclusion. It's been a resounding success. We've seen the ice pads, the pools, the gym, and the fitness center all being extraordinarily well used, I think even beyond what perhaps we thought the attendance and usage might be. If you're ever at the uh, fitness center, and I must admit I don't see all of you there, but I'm there pretty early in the morning, so I assume you all go later in the day. It's extraordinarily well used. Everyone's having a good time. It's a real community place and one that we should be very, very proud of. We've got all of the, I think, tools in place now for the future for this center. We've got the lease with the YMCA finalized. We've got the memorandum on future ownership done, and we've got the operating agreement in place. So we have all of the tools we need now to move forward in a very positive manner. Um, we are, in essence, set for the future for this center. Turning now to what we do best, of course, is policies and plans. Uh, we completed the official plan five-year review, an update that was very critical to this city. This is the first time we really brought that forward, um, encapsulating what we're going to be doing in this city. It was approved by county council. However, it has been appealed by Villabot, and we will be uh, speaking to you further on that. We did the uh, bylaw regarding complimentary parking, re sorry, the complimentary parking review, um, and we've extended one block north and south on 2nd Avenue, so we now have complimentary parking from 7th Street to 11th Street. So again, after um, very thoughtful debate, uh, we got that through. Uh, the trails master plan, it's now our plan for the future for our trails in the city, another very important building block, one that will build on what you heard previously tonight from Kim. Um, it's all part of getting our people active and out there in our wonderful open spaces. Uh, we've got our transit study that 
was largely completed in 2012. It's still being examined by committee. Um, one of the things that came out of that study is we have a very high level of excellence and service for our transit in this city. We completed a new strategic plan in 2012. That'll take us through to 2015. Um, we confirmed our vision for the city, where you want to live. We brought in a new mission statement to provide progressive leadership for education, culture, recreation, health, social and economic opportunities that benefit the city and the region. We set out five pillars, if you will, in that strategic plan, financial sustainability, community building, economic development, cultural focus, and environmental awareness. We need now to confirm our objectives, complete a detailed action plan and a scorecard, develop the tools and methodology for operationalizing the strategic plan, uh, we need to communicate those results and probably most importantly develop a public communication plan. We are working at training staff in that area and we'll be progressing and getting back to you in short order regarding our strategic plan um, move forward steps. The court security agreement was a re-upload um, wasn't quite what we had expected. It was $61,300, which just happened to be a offset by the OMPF funding. So I'm not sure we totally won on that one. Other policies and plans that we've completed, the Greenwood Cemetery Master Plan Review, our Business Retention and Expansion Report, our Winter Maintenance Program, our museum's operations review, and our zoning bylaw housekeeping amendment. Under the cemetery master plan review, it does provide for maintenance, enhancement, and longevity of the cemetery, ensuring that we can meet the city's needs well into the distant future. Under our BR and E expansion report, we now have a plan in place to address all of the areas highlighted in that report and there were 16 specific recommendations that we are working towards completing those recommendations. Under winter maintenance, that may come up further again this evening, but I did want to emphasize that our new policy had no effect on the recent snow event. Under museums, we have now a very exciting new program and in integration with the Tom Thompson Art Gallery, and that's very successful. And under our zoning bylaw, anytime we do housekeeping, what we're doing is ensuring that we identify issues and that we are fine tuning to meet today's needs and probably most importantly, tomorrow's needs. Under new initiatives, we had the Invest on Sound initiative. Uh, where we um, completed the sale of one property, we developed a process on how to sell our town surplus properties, and we identified a number of properties that we're going to continue to move forward on to sell. We implemented e-billing for utilities, and we implemented a 12-month pre-authorized debit plan for property taxes. Both of those are a reflection of our ongoing commitment to customer service and making sure that we can provide good value for people and make it as easy as possible for them to access our services. Under emergency management, we implemented an incident management system, again ensuring that we can protect and meet all possible events in a very strategic and timely manner. Under the Charitable Gaming Center Municipal Municipality Agreement, we now um, have a number of groups who have moved forward uh, and want to see a new bingo center in Owen Sound. Our new initiatives, you saw uh, the I Love Owen Sound Where You Want to Live campaign, a really, really successful campaign. We had some amazing submissions and we're using those in a variety of our promotional materials uh, currently.
We did our Safe Trails and Signage project, which uh, we implemented in Harrison Park so that I don't get lost anymore trying to get from Harrison Park up to Inglis Falls. I haven't tested it yet, but um, when we have a little bit less snow, I intend to do that. We implemented a new grass cutting strategy, and we also um, did our parking meter review. We now have new ticket spitters and new meters. So again, a customer service uh, activity that will better serve people downtown. Our events. We have a very exciting first dock party by the Bay. My understanding is we're going to do it again this year. We had Big Music Fest. We had the Queen's Park Bandstand opening, which was a resounding success. We had a job fair with 13 employers and over 1,000 people attending that event. And we had the flotilla, which represented the Harrison Park Old Time Picnic, which celebrated 100 years. An amazing event, one that an awful lot of people really enjoyed. And there's the queen waving. We got all the paperwork together and started planning and receiving funding for the Tall Ships Rendezvous. Um, again, as uh, I think we've noted before, we have 25% of our anticipated boarding passes already sold. So it's going to be a great event. We launched the Canadian Spirit 2012 initiative, which is a cross-disciplinary exhibit which examines Thompson's life work and mythical death and his influence both direct and indirect on Canadian art culture. And that's successfully launched in 2012 with some very positive events for 2013 as well. Under infrastructure, we completed parking lot five reconstruction. We had JEP funding approved for an emergency operations center, which is in the planning stages now and will shortly go out to tender. We have the council chambers renovations, which you will see um, later this evening uh, to get to the final stage of that. We have municipal um, solar installations. Uh, we have them self-financed, and they are starting to generate revenues in 2012. And we have the new communication tower for the On Sound Police Services Partnership as well. Under the infrastructure category, we have the ongoing renovation of the CP rail station through two Ontario Heritage uh, grants and rural red funding. So we have over $200,000 that we've got into that station and we're looking to successfully lease it in the very near future. We also had the 4th Avenue East and West reconstruction. 4th Avenue East was a $750,000 project and the 4th and the I may have these 4th Avenue West was 430,000. Is that correct? Good. A lot of money for both of those. Um, one of our, again, a very, whoops, very successful uh, negotiation and agreement was the wastewater treatment plant upgrade project where we got the First Nation protocol agreement in place um, and we're ready to move forward on what is our next large project for the city of Owen Sound. In development, we have the Villabot Development Corp Heritage Grove Center. You can see it uh, just beside Home Depot. It's a 12,700 square meters in size. We had the new 62 uh, Woodland Estate Residential Development, and we had 52 residential building permits and $27 million worth of construction value. So uh, tonight we had the downtown riverfront design study, which uh, was very, very well received. And we had the skateboard and bike park public meetings and design exercise as well. And that's coming to a conclusion as well. <coughs> Under actual development, we had 14 consents and 13 variances. We think that's a pretty small number of variances, which is a reflection from staff's perspective that our zoning bylaw is working. 
and we're not seeing the large numbers that you may have seen in the past. We had 12 site plan applications. We did the, the, the design shred on the waterfront. We had the facade program had five new facade grants approved and eight grants were actually paid out. Under technology, we created and updated a secure website for council meetings. We're live streaming council meetings. We've done significant network <coughs> upgrades. We've created various online features, including the Safe Trails Network and Recreation Facilities Mapping. And as you're aware, we are implementing a GIS system, and we have completed, or largely completed, enhanced Wi-Fi in the downtown area. We had a phone system upgrade. I didn't even know we had a phone system upgrade. That's how good it was. Um, we had over 2,500 help desk tickets closed. We put fiber between the fire hall and the regional recreation center. And we researched and recommended a solution for the art gallery payment system as well. <clears throat> Under staffing, we had two Georgian College co-op students with us this year provided growth and mentoring opportunities for us. We had the first student in residence from Western at the Tom. We had three student research assistants from Western. And we also had two family practice residents recruited in 2012 and they are working with the family health team. Under recognitions, we had a number of Diamond Jubilee recognitions. We were recognized as the affiliate second prize winner in the World Fishing Network Ultimate Fishing Town. <clears throat> and we were named the top city to retire by MSN. So council, congratulations on a successful 2012. <coughs> and I look forward to working with you for an exciting 2013. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Corsi, it's uh, good to take a minute and reflect on all the successes we often, around this table and in the community, we, t we tend to focus on the negative and the things that haven't happened. And it's really good to be reminded of how much has been accomplished and how much of it is, is positive uh, for the community and a recognition of how much we all appreciate this community and, and how much we, we want to see invested in it. Uh, thank you very much. Are there any uh, comments or questions, uh, Councillor Purden? Yes, this is a really nice report to have and to, to read over. And uh, I think we have to also acknowledge the staff and the hard work that's gone on. It's, <coughs> it's not a, a big staff with the city, but there's an amazing amount of work that's done. So um, I think that's very important. Thank you indeed. I think we all know staff. Uh, put in a lot of time and, and are very professional and very dedicated. Any other comments or questions? Councillor Wright. <coughs> yes, yeah, sorry. Oh, sorry, thank you. I just, um, I wanna say thank you to our city manager. I was trying to sit here thinking, did, did I ever have a report like that before of all the accomplishments that happened in a year? And I honestly can't remember it. We you had one last year, actually. Did, we have one last year? <laughs> Did you present it? Yes. I think I was away at that time. Maybe you were. Yes. But anyway, I, that it, it, it is really nice to take a look at all of the accomplishments and has been mentioned before. I, I was just sitting here thinking, boy, you know, that's not a bad job for a year in, in review and uh, thank you. <laughs> <coughs> Sorry, Councillor Chamberlain. Yes, I'll add mine as well. I'm very proud of that presentation. and. Uh, I also realize that it represents a lot of volunteer hours, and this community is very fortunate to have the engagement that we have from our, our, our citizens, and we're all making it the place where we want to live. And thank you very much. Any other comments or questions? Uh, motion to receive the report. Moved by Councillor Wright. All in favor? That's carried unanimously. Thank you very much. <coughs> It was a night for uh, 
slideshows and presentations. <laughs> Next up is uh, <coughs> Manager of Economic Development and Tourism <coughs> with the 2012 highlights. Uh, Mr. Furness, welcome. <coughs> Uh, I'm not going to be more animated than the city manager. <laughs> Four PowerPoints in a row. <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to give you a presentation. I uh, would have given you this earlier, uh, except I had a little disagreement with a hockey puck and it won. Uh, so this is a review, uh, not, all, uh, not a review of all the economic development activities we undertook, but just an overview, but a particular focus on our our branding and marketing that uh, we've been undertaking. So um, there are five, five areas where uh, the committee in 2012, and many of these have been areas that we've worked on in the past, but basically they fit within the four main areas of economic development, uh, that being small business and entrepreneurship, which is really centered around our enterprise center, business retention and expansion, uh, new business attraction, and then tourism development and, and marketing. And I must say that uh, the Economic Development and Tourism Committee does not own all these areas, but, all, but a lot of our work is in these areas. So there's many other parts of the city that contribute to these four pillars. Um, and I'm going to go over a few of these, but not all of them. Uh, but basically our activities, uh, if you're involved in Marketing and branding and communicating an image, that's part of, uh, a big part of what economic development is about. Uh, research analysis and, and, and uh, understanding, uh, understanding what the world is about, it's always changing. Statistics is very important. And then retention and attraction and investment in jobs. And really that's what, um, that's what economic development is about. And just to remind everybody that new jobs are generally created from local businesses that are expanding and new startup companies. Um, you, get, you do get new jobs from relocating companies, and that's important, but the majority of growth will come from existing businesses as they grow. Uh, for next steps for 2013, uh, we'll have a work plan and, and another session with our committee and get input from council to identify the actions and projects, and we do got to, we have to continue to collaborate, cooperate, and communicate. And I do think the macro environment is improving. Since the crash in 2008, uh, the world, literally the world changed from an economic development point of view, and we were not uh, isolated. So some of the things that we were working on before that really got put on hold, uh, and I would think now things are coming back, uh, and as the particularly as the U.S. economy moves, we're starting to see things happen. A lot of what I do is try and make the phone ring, and once the phone rings, everything else stops, because that's what we want. We want that phone to ring, we want those questions to be asked, we want developers and invest investors coming forward. So when we're st I'm starting to see that. Um, so one of the areas we've worked on, and we worked on this with the Chamber of Commerce, and through and now Gray County is uh, IT infrastructure and basically trying to understand affordable bandwidth. Uh, it was first identified through our business retention and expansion survey and then the chamber had a public forum. Uh, basically some of our businesses are starting to see uh, limits in terms of bandwidth and challenges. We still have the last mile is still copper and in, in rural areas, particularly in our, in our community, uh, wireless is, is the only solution, although that's improving. Um, the end solution is fiber. Uh, it, at this point, doesn't seem to have limitations. Uh, Great, Great County IT is going to be inventorying the existing fiber, and uh, it's basically fundamental, not just for business, but the public sector and our residents. So we're going to continue to work on this project. Um, and we've been attending some of the conferences to understand the, that need. 
the larger Western Warden Caucus is also undertaking a study, and uh, we're having another st another meeting with the Chamber in Gray County, uh, I think February 11th. So understanding the issue, determining what the need is, and bringing our knowledge workers together will be what I'll be looking at in 2013. Labor pool. Um, this is one that I think the best quote, and I kind of got the people without jobs and jobs without people. Um, you need skills in today's job market, and employers need people with skills. And when the labor market gets out of whack, we can sometimes hear from the unemployed that they can't find jobs, and I can turn around and talk to employers who will say, I can't find employees. And really, what we're talking about is not bodies, but skill sets. And uh, that's really what we're trying to, uh, what the job fair that we had in early January 2012 was about. Uh, we also support uh, Liv Gray Bruce. Tony Selecki uh, was kind of cheerleading that uh, website to help link up people from outside the area who have a certain skill who want to move back with employers looking for those skill sets. Um, I think another part of our labor pool is asking the question, are we welcoming? And the committee asked this question about immigration a number of times. And I can see uh, we went to a seminar and there's an awful lot that could be done. And I understand Councillor Burden has been uh, kind of reacting to a, or leading a, a groundswell uh, asking the same question. So we look forward to hearing more from that. Um, EMC, the school board, and the training board got together at Tenneco, and there was some very interesting discussion around how to improve co-op and link in with the high schools. But there was really a good discussion around um, a discussion on work ethic and how we can improve that. So we'll be looking again at, at, at labor pool, but I think one of the big, big successes in our community over the last few years, and we continue to really encourage and push is Georgian College, and we were again down at the Marine Club event and had an opportunity to spend quite a bit of time with uh, the senior management of Georgian College. Waterfront development, I won't spend a whole lot of time, but we've been continuing to work on uh, different studies there, the design charrette, really put a lot of the waterfront properties in one location with all the information and that's been very useful. I think the CP rail station, that before and after picture is really remarkable. Uh, and a, a real eye store and now something to, that people want to go through. And of, of course we got to continue that and, and get it leased. Uh, but we'll be looking at doing that. And we attended the Zoomer show for the first time and I think we'll do that again with, with other uh, developers. Uh, our BRE and our business retention and expansion action items, these are the 16 areas, and I, we've worked on some of these very specifically, others I think we could, it's just a matter of time, but I would like to point out a couple that I think that have done um, remarkably well. I think the council is continuing to reduce business taxes, and the graph when we show the reduction is really starting to have an effect. I think we're, we've been better able to communicate what we're doing. We were on the radio, we had newsletters, but we have to work even harder at that. It's not an easy market to, to, to communicate uh, your successes. So I think we'll continue to work in these areas. Um, I'll also point out that one of the bigger, biggest items in this survey was downtown parking, and I think the success the city had with the DIA will prove that out this for in the next year. So branding and marketing, and this is an area I'm going to focus on. Um, we're following the eSolutions marketing strategy, and those were the, that was the consulting firm that came up with our, our tagline and logo. Uh, and we truly tried to integrate this message across uh, our marketing in terms of what economic development does, the business enterprise center and tourism and others. And every time we see the logo and the tagline, it, it reinforces what we like. But branding starts at home, and really we spent a lot of time working on branding within the local community and highlighting the successes. This photo is um, a photo of the Sydenham Sportsman Club. They go to 12 different shows. Um, they asked me for the tablecloths. I didn't attend that show. We gave them the material and the, and the tablecloths with the branding and it works really well for them, and it's great when we start to get our community partners getting our message out. So branding, and I think we can successfully, well, it's very hard to measure, I think it's successfully, we can successfully say that 
residents and businesses in this community understand what our tagline is. That's where we want to live. Um, and we've done the, uh, tried to reinforce this in all our, our ads and our branding and our marketing and in the, in the, in the, in the magazines and, and publications that we tried to get this out in. So it, it's right from retirement to quality of life and it's in all our publications. And these are our core city publications. There's over 200 tourism pieces. And of course, many of these are online as well. And promotional items as well. Um, although we don't have a very large budget, we try and match these to what will help get the message out. Now, radio is where we did a lot of branding this year, and uh, we used it a, c a couple of different ways. The I Love On Sound was primarily done through social media on the radio, the two main stations. We had an hour-long talk show uh, once a month. We were used Fan 590 to promote, I guess, the Big One Contest in the Salmon Derby, and we promoted our Where You Want to Live on the, on the Mix in the Dock in uh, Country 93 with a fairly significant campaign. And I'll just play a clip here. Neil Kemp, COO of Aspen Kemp & Associates, thinks Owen Sound is a great place to live and work. If you can run your business from a, a smaller community, um, even if you were setting up a small manufacturing plant, it's cheaper, it's a better way of life, uh, it's better for your kids. Certainly all the staff that uh, we have who work in our own sound office love being in this part of the world, and that, they wouldn't give that up for anything. Owen Sound, where you want to live. So we had a number of clips. That wasn't the only one. We had about six or seven different clips, and we concentrated that over the peak summer uh, tourism season and then again at, uh, at Christmas. Um, and we'll have to decide, the committee will have to decide where the focus will be, will be for next year, but probably reinforcing it to some degree. Uh, we were at a number of trade shows, both locally and uh, outside the area. Uh, I must say that we switched from uh, the Royal Winter Fair to the Zoomer show, and um, I think that was a good show. Both shows were good, but I think the Zoomer show was particularly uh, bang on, and we were there in partnership with Gray County and uh, Cabo Beach, and uh, we'll be looking to do a few more different shows with, with them. <coughs> the Visitor Center, um, again, I think this is a very important statistic with 6,800 visitors in 2012, virtually the same as, as last year, uh, but they also call, have a number of 1-800 calls, emails, and relocation packages. Um, the visitor center has a critical fulfillment piece. We get all the email numbers and all the uh, social media. It's all about getting them here, and once they show up at a visitor center, we have a real opportunity to, to extend their stay. And, um, and it's an interesting statistic to see uh, how many people in September are actually long-haul visitors. And this is a trend we continue to see uh, more and more visitors, not necessarily from the states, but uh, from outside the country, tour touring the whole area and the whole region. So our website, a number of, I think it was two years ago, that we made a conscious effort to really try and reach out through um, through the website, and in last year alone, we had a 39% increase in the number of unique users. We had a 31% increase in the number of page viewed. It represents about 37% of the total website traffic, including uh, the the weekly email blast. And together with tourism and business, it represents a very significant amount of activity on the tourism on the city website, which. I think one would expect when people are doing research, whether it's for business or for tourism. So social media, again, we are into the, again pushing forward and, and, and having quite a lot of success in our second year on Facebook, and this year we started with, with Twitter. Um, we really saw a jump in the number of likes and the reach after online advertising, and, and I think the biggest impact was with the tall ships and the, and the, and the online um, Facebook ads that uh, Mr. Cleverly took out. So we're going to be looking at doing more of that. Uh, Twitter, uh, again, another big uh, way to get our messages out and, and, and seems to be working quite well. And a number of YouTube videos where we can start to brand our, our many special events. So 
I won't play this whole one, but... encourage you to go and see the whole uh, video and all the other videos that we've done. So, so far we've had 7,400 um, YouTube views and we'll continue to expand that. And in the media, again, uh, trying to get articles published, uh, we've had some success. I think it's always difficult to try and break into some of the larger media, but uh, again, uh, using the many uh, avenues that we have, we, had, we did have some success this year. Um, and certainly our contests uh, particularly the I Love Own Sound contest was, was very successful and we'll be doing something similar, although maybe not uh, to the same extent. And again, um, this was the winning video. I won't, I'll just play the beginning part, but... I did play it all. Couldn't turn it off. Um, and of course, this little guy in the corner uh, with his with his uh, canoe that that the Salmon Spectacular folks donated. So we're going to continue again some of those contests, and uh, they reinforce the quality of life and and why we're here. And um, and of course, our economic development has the same message. This first ad on the far left was the back of the vacation um, our vacation guide, and it highlighted a particular local. Uh, consulting firm that, that chooses to live in own sound. So again, um, priorities for next year will be uh, re reviewed by the committee, but I think we had a successful year of branding and we'll have, obviously there will be new priorities, but I look forward to having another good year. Uh, if there's any questions, and sorry, hopefully next year I can get to you before the end of the year. But <laughs> oh. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Furness. Any comments or questions? There were a couple of points in the last two presentations that I think just bear repeating uh, because there was so much information. Um, one of them, uh, Steve, was, was a comment you made about the city's continuing reduction in business and commercial tax rates. Uh, and I, th I think that we've seen some significant movement there and I, that I'm glad that you're getting that message out through the business community. I'm not sure that as a council, we've been as effective in getting that out. And um, Ms. Corsi, in your presentation, you, you mentioned uh, $27 million in building permits issued in 2012. And that's a significant increase from the previous year. Um, 50, building permits issued for 52 new housing units, and that's not all of that is the Woodland Estates, which is a, a whole new subdivision that's being developed. So. Um, in a difficult and uh, challenging economy, we are still making progress, and I think it's it's good that <coughs> those two, uh, among other things, were brought forward tonight. Thank you very much. Um, just need a more. Uh, sorry, Councillor Purden. Well, I just wanted to comment that what I really like about uh, all of this work is that the it captures the kind of the aesthetic of our community. We live in such a beautiful community, and. Um, so much of the presentation really showcases the beauty of the area, and I think that that's a quality that's going to be increasingly um, favorable for us. Um, so I really, I really like to see that in the branding, in the marketing, and just um, 
in the whole package, I think it's really important. And I, I would move the acceptance of the report if you'd like that too. Thank you, yes, I was gonna ask for a motion. Any other comments or questions? All in favor? That's carried, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Furness. <coughs> Next item is the report from the Director of Finance on the annual statement of remuneration and expenses. <coughs> this is a requirement, part of the transparency. We need a motion to receive. Councillor Dare. Also move. Any comments or questions? All in favor? That's carried. Thank you. <coughs> uh, Director of Community Services report on the memorial clock. That would be the clock in front of City Hall that's right twice a day. Ms. Kohler, did you want to uh, just briefly summarize the report? Certainly, thank you. As <coughs> Council is aware, in 1961, the original City Hall uh, and the clock tower was destroyed by fire. In 1965, when the new City Hall was opened, um, it featured a new clock tower with a functioning clock. There's three plaques that are on the uh, on the tower, and they were celebrated uh, by the relatives, or sorry, they were placed there by the relatives and friends in memory of the former mayors of Own Sound. And the first plaque reads the town of Own Sound, and the second plaque reads the city of Own Sound. As Councillor Twaddle alluded to, it's no longer effective to repair the the, the current clock. Um, <clears throat> the report. Uh, considers whether or not we should look to an LED type clock or an analog type clock. Um, it's my recommendation to you that more in keeping with the downtown heritage theme, uh, it would be appropriate um, to replace it with an analog clock. The, the process would be that we would go out to an RFP for the replacement of a, of a clock uh, that would come back to council with the results of that RFP process. The RFP will be written in, in such a way that we'll be looking at uh, the maintenance, the, the warranty, and the, the character of the clock, among other, among other items. Thank you. Councillor Lemon. <clears throat> yes, Your Worship, I would move the recommendation I think it's an excellent uh, idea, and I certainly agree with keeping an analog style clock because that's how the tower was originally developed. The one thing we should also be considering is a uh, uh, possibility of uh, adding more mares to it. Um, I think they're friends and family of a lot of the people since 1971. And, uh, no, we stopped in 71, I thought. Oh, we have, we still need, okay. I didn't, I didn't realize it had been updated, but it hasn't been updated since, yeah, okay. Thank you. <coughs> I move that recommendation. <coughs> Thank you, we have a motion. Any other comments or questions? Uh, Councillor McManaman. Thank you, Worship. I, yeah, just a question, I apologize if I, Apologize if I missed this. Did you comment on the financial impact? And I'm sorry if you did. I just sorry, I, I didn't really review that. The estimated cost of the, the replacement clock is $8,000. At this time, we've had an individual come forward um, who at this time will remain an anonymous donor, uh, but that will uh, come forward through the process and that will become public. But at this point, there will be no financial impact to council, to the city. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? We have a motion. All in favor? Carried unanimously. Thank you very much. The next item is a tender for the council chamber renovations. Recommendation is to uh, accept the uh, bid from Clarence Graham Design and Construction in the amount of $138,760. Uh, Ms. Corsi, did you want to comment on this? Uh, thank you, uh, Councillor Twaddle. I would like to comment that while this is a significant amount of money, it is a large part to better serve the public. It is about making sure that we have a council chamber that is accessible, that no longer has uh, asbestos in it, 
that has better lighting and better sound so that people can see and hear us better, that it's welcoming to the public. We have taken that row of staff members and moved them around to the side so that the public can have a much more direct uh, contact with council and the podium will come closer to council as well. So this is a bare bones budget. It is one that is necessary in my opinion to bring the council chambers up to an appropriate standard for members of the public to come and interact with council and for council to more efficiently and effectively do the business of the city. Thank you. Corsi. Uh, Councilor Wright. Thank you very much. I, I'll, I'll move the recommendation that we move ahead, but I have a question. Uh, I didn't notice any completion date. Did they give us any idea when the completion date might be? Uh, we're hoping to have it completed by March 31st. Thank you. Councilor Dare? I just didn't hear, I think. Oh, okay. Uh, Councilor Boddy. So that'll get us pretty close to the 50th anniversary of the building, building I think, by March 31st. <laughs> it, it, uh, uh, the building will be 50 years old within the next year or two. It's no wonder the clock doesn't work. It's no wonder that uh, we finally had to put some money into the I bet you I'm not the first councillor that said that in the last 40 years, but uh, this, it doesn't surprise me that it's going to cost this kind of money, and uh, given you spread that out over 50 years, uh, it, it's not a bad expense at all. <coughs> Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Motion is to approve the tender. All in favor? That's carried. From the event facilitator regarding the tall ships and the agreement with Bytown Brigantine. Uh, does someone want to speak to this? Uh, Councillor Lemon? I would move the recommendation, uh, and uh, I think this is just being a fantastic success with 25% of the expected tickets already sold. Um, I think it's going to really accentuate our harbor. I just hope it's deep enough. Thank you. Ms. Coulter, did you wish to comment? Or? Certainly. Just uh, as a quick review, this is <coughs> the fifth update already. It's hard to believe that it's already the fifth update for Council. The agreement with the Folk Society on um, the partnership around the entertainment. Unfortunately, there was a snow event last week and their board couldn't meet, so we're still waiting on that agreement that council had approved to be reviewed by their board. Um, tonight, uh, there is uh, a recommendation for the, the next ship, that is the uh, Fair Jean, and um, so that, that will come forward in the form of a bylaw. Ticket sales, as Councillor Lemon noted, were 25% of the way there, so that's very exciting. In terms of critical next steps, we're looking to secure our major event partnership. So we're looking for sh title sponsors and ship sponsors. Tomorrow we're doing interviews for the um, position of the project coordinator and we'll be completing <coughs> and revising the marketing plan and bringing that forward back to council. Thank you, any comments or questions? Uh, Councilor Wally. One question. Uh, the employees that were hiring, I understand that's on a grant that's part of the, uh, the whole program. It's covered as part of the provincial grant, so it's in the budget that council approved. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? All in favor? Well, it's carried. Thank you very much. Report on a municipal access agreement with Packet Tell, the company that uh, wants to install fiber optic equipment. Um, Mr. McRoberts, were you going to speak to this? Uh, certainly, Ken. Um, just, to, just to give a quick update, uh, we have on regular occasions to enter into what we call municipal access agreements with various utilities to use our 
basically right-of-ways and roadways throughout the city. Uh, in this case, this happens to be Pacatel. They are a um, provider of high-speed internet or, or um, internet access through fiber. Um, in this certain spe specific case, this company is looking at trying to install some fiber cables to link between their customers, which are at this point in time uh, school boards, including the uh, Catholic school board as well as the Grey Bruce uh, Blue Water School Board. Um, so their intention is pretty specific to linking uh, connections between Hillcrest, um, St. Basil, and West Hill, as well as linking uh, OSCVI and, uh, and Sydenham schools on those specific areas. Councillor Boddy. Just going to uh, move the recommendation and uh, point out uh, Mayor Haswell was away last week at uh, Smart Communities um, program of some sort. As we move forward to be able to attract high end uh, computer type businesses, whether it be engineering, anybody that's going to be uploading their, uh, their product and sending it uh, out of the city, if we want to attract those types of jobs to replace our manufacturing. We're going to have to look at increasing our, um, our uh, fiber optics throughout the city. We're all going to hear a lot about uh, IT infrastructure and about fiber optics over the next couple of years. And uh, this is starting, this is a private company, obviously, that's uh, providing to private clients. But little by little, we're going to have to figure out how to uh, add more fiber optics to our city and throughout our city so we can become more competitive with other communities in the area. But I, I move uh, this motion. Thank you. Councillor Wright? Uh, thank you very much. I, I'm very, very supportive of any kind of fiber optics that go in, but my question is on our right-of-ways, is this air or underground? Um, it, would, it can and, and would there probably be both. Certainly in the initial installation that Pocatel is looking at, they will be using both underground as well as overhead using hydro poles. And is, it, and is it just going to go between the schools? Is that uh, what their plan mm -hmm. is? At this point in time, yes. I mean, certainly they will, they're a private company. They will look at opportunities to connect <coughs> in <coughs> wants to connect between their businesses perchance. Um, they do it basically as part of their business model. Uh, in this case, one of their customers happens to be the two school boards. Yeah, I just, it seems to me it's a, quite an expensive undertaking for them if uh, if they're not going to expand into other areas, but that may be something that'll come. Yeah, I certainly understand that um, if they have excess capacity on those fiber cables, uh, they would make them available to any other customers. <coughs> well, that's part of my question. Uh, when you, your discussions with them, which uh, was there any indication that they would be trying to develop more in this market? Uh, I, would, I would say that certainly their discussions have been limited to the installations that they're looking at initially. Um, I think certainly as a business model, they would be happy to try to put more installation in if the business case was there. I'm sure Steve will be looking into it. <coughs> Councillor Dare. Thank you, Councillor Twaddle. I'm just echoing what uh, Councillor uh, body has said, I think as a council, we are at some point sooner than later, I think, needing to get our heads around the whole issue of um, fiber optic and high speed internet in, in the city. It's not the infrastructure of tomorrow, it's the infrastructure now. <coughs> it's sort of like um, the rural electrification, uh, um, you know, decades ago, we, we need to be involved with this in some extent. We certainly had a report tonight that the Economic Development Committee is uh, looking at that. I would look forward to a more fulsome report from uh, Economic Development and IT about where where the city is going with um, with this new infrastructure and how we can get involved. Thank you, Councillor McManaman. No, thank you. Uh, questions for Mr. McRoberts. Uh, first thing, there's no financial uh, impact. So this is similar to. Um, uh, gas lines in the right of way, we, they require our, our approval, but we, we can't really <coughs> deny it without some val valid reason. Yeah, certainly we enter in, as with any utility, we usually enter into these agreements. They're basically on the pretext that 
They're permitted to use um, our road allowances, our right-of-ways um, at their cost. It's their cost of installation, so there's no financial impact to the city itself. Uh, they're responsible for any relocation of those utilities if the city happens to be doing some reconstruction in certainly in those areas. This is basically just to make sure that it's understood between the city and that organization um, whose responsibilities are what and the process to go through and the approvals required for that. Certainly when they get to a stage where they actually wish to proceed with the work, they will have to go through the regular permit process with the city and pay those permit fees. Uh, but as a private company, there's no uh, payment involved from them to use our right of way. Correct. Um, this doesn't limit us if there's other, this is a private company. If there were three other private companies, we would, uh, w this doesn't limit us in any way in dealing with them? Correct, it's not exclusive. They don't have exclusive rights. Okay. All right, thank you. Jay Rowan? Yes, and I just wondered if it has any impact on our GPS uh, underground work that we're doing, or is there any opportunity there? Sorry, I'm not sure of the specific question. That I used the wrong word. Um, or the mapping that we're trying to do. Um, we are actually going to be, um, I wanted to keep it a surprise, but I guess it's not a surprise anymore. Oh. Um, we're going to be mapping out all of our fiber locations that we can identify. We're going to layer that in our, GP, in our GIS system. We're going to link that to our zoning. Um, and show you where industrial areas are and where there might be gaps, et cetera. So we're trying to get your base information um, and then we'll determine how to move forward. Given that in large part this is private enterprise, so we, we need to put our hand in their back, if you will, and nudge them forward. Any other? Oh, Councillor McManaman. Thank you. Uh, just, just coming back to uh, the private enterprise aspect of it, so uh, is there no role for us to coordinate? Uh, th there's limited space in the right of way. If we were to s receive five more requests like this, we would, uh, we'd, we, well, we'd have to accept them as long as they were willing to meet uh, our, our guidelines. They, I, you see what I'm saying? Like, uh, I guess if, if You've described this Pacatel one as dealing with specific customers. Uh, next week we, we get another one that wants to deal with, is there no role for coordination here, I suppose? Uh, you had said, you talked about excess bandwidth, or if that's the correct term, in fiber optics. Um, uh, you know, we're going to allow them to go from West Hill to Hillcrest. Uh, next week we're going to get somebody that wants to go from uh, you know, either side of that. Is there no role for us at all to piggyback on some of on some of this? Um, yeah, and I, I apologize if I'm not apologize if I'm not explaining it properly, but I'm just worried about the piecemeal aspect of it. I guess um, certainly whatever they do provide from a standpoint of their intentions uh, from a construction plan, they do need to get the approval of the manager of engineering services, so they will have to go through that process. Um, we do have certain clauses in here that give the opportunities that if they have excess bandwidth within their, their fiber, ca fiber cables, that they can provide that bandwidth to other companies, basically on a, a usage type basis. Um, we also have some rights within the city ourselves. If we want to use some aspect of that, we would be, be available to us. Um, from a coordination standpoint, I don't think we have a, you know, a fulsome coordination with respect to all these different utilities that go in. Um, we do look at it from a standpoint, though, when uh, the company brings forward its actual construction plans as to where they're locating it within the, the road allowance and what other utilities might be in that road allowance at that time. <clears throat> we have a motion. All in favor? That's carried unanimously. Thank you. <clears throat> the next issue is minutes of the bylaw committee and the uh, Rec Room Parks Advisory Committee. Uh, I've declared a pecuniary interest on item 7A in the bylaw minutes and I would ask if that item could be pulled and we'll deal with the rest of the bylaws first if that's uh, agreeable with council. <coughs> 
two sets of bylaw minutes, save and accept 7A in the bylaw minutes. Councilor McManaman. I'll move those uh, two sets of minutes uh, with that item pulled. Any comments or questions around those two issues? Seeing none, all in favor? Uh, it's carried. I'll ask Councilor Adair to take the chair, please. It's very different up here. <laughs> um, so we have a uh, portion of the minutes of the uh, bylaw committee. What would council like to do with that? Councillor Purden? Um, I would move uh, acceptance of that uh, bylaw to temporarily provide three monthly passes to the Owen Sound Little Theatre as a cultural organization and to revoke those passes uh, when the Scopus party, uh, property is sold. So basically a, a motion to approve that portion it's, of the minutes. It's the motion that was approved by the bylaw committee at that meeting. Yeah. Discussion, Councillor McManaman. Thank you, your, your Adair's fine. Councillor Adair, <laughs> acting, acting, worship didn't sound right. Um, I did want to speak to this item. Um, about providing three monthly uh, passes at the, to the Roxy Little Theatre uh, behind their building in that parking lot we call it the Scopas, the Scopas lot. Um, at the committee meeting, I'll, I'll say up front, I voted in, in favor of this. Um, one of the benefits, I think, of our committee system is to allow time for uh, reflection on some of the, uh, the minutes. And I do have a concern uh, with providing those, those spaces. Um, my first one is uh, in that in that lot. My first one is, I, I'm afraid it provides or uh, sets a precedent that we may not be able to follow through on in the coming months. Uh, there are many non-for-profit uh, uh, businesses, I, I guess I'll call them in the downtown core, that I'm afraid, as Councillor Twaddle said at the beginning of this meeting, that if this passes, we'll be asking for similar treatment. Um, for free parking, um, and I would be concerned how we choose one over the other. The other issue is around our parking system. Uh, I have been a strong proponent of that we shouldn't be um, piecemealing or one-offing decisions on parking, uh, and then I sat in a committee meeting where we did just that, So, uh, and, and I supported that, so I, I, I'm, I'm concerned that um, we'd look at their request and, and if it's approved tonight, what's three spots in a parking? I think that Scopa's lot holds 20, 20 cars. So what's three spots? Well, and that's fine, except next week we'll be hearing from another group and another group and another group, and we'll, we're going to go back to discussing parking issues on a, I would worry, on a semi-regular basis. Um, with that in mind, so I won't be supporting uh, the, the motion that's on the floor. Um, and I do wonder, and I would suggest this to the bylaw committee, uh, at their next meeting to take a look at. So I, I think it might be better to refer the request to that parking discussion uh, meeting that's in October. Another thing that I think they could look at, the committee could look at in the interim though, is that lot currently right now, if you don't have a monthly pass, you cannot park there. It's not uh, for half an hour or 15 minutes or two hours, there's no uh, mechanism for to allow you to park in that lot. And I think one of the things we heard from the Roxy was that their volunteers you know, they're, they're there during the day, they're there for an hour. They can't park there at all, no matter what. So one uh, opportunity might be to take a look at that whole situation. Um, there's a ticket spitter for lot five, which is right next door, that I understand the process would be fairly simple to just change that, put up some signage and allow hourly parking or, or uh, uh, from the ticket spitter. And again, that wouldn't obviously allow the Roxy free parking, but it would put them on an equal footing to have parking right behind their building for half an hour, two hours, all day if they wanted, but um, without the burden of having to buy a monthly pass if it wasn't required. So um, I guess depending on how this motion goes, I won't be supporting it. I, I would suggest we would refer it to October 
and I would also then have a subsequent motion for the committee, the bylaw committee, to look at that exact parking lot and, and talk about uh, allowing hourly parking in there. So, thank you. Any other uh, comments, Councillor uh, Body, and then Councillor Lemon? Go ahead. As I recall, when we were uh, discussing budget items, uh, we looked at whether we were going to give out grants this year, and we agreed once again that we would not be giving out grants, that it would be zero. And as I recall, we had a conversation around this type of thing. Last year, we got down that slippery slope, and we just kept sliding that we were saying yes to some people, not saying yes to other people. And a lot of that is around uh, free rentals at the uh, Bay Shore and giving out free this and free that. To me, this is just another giving out something free that gets us down that slope again. Interestingly enough, we're uh, not till the end of January and we've had two requests tonight for something free. And here we are starting off already. Good causes, all of them. They're always good causes. Then we start picking apart, saying we don't have a budget for this because we agreed that we weren't going to put a budget to it. But we, we overlook that. Um, I think if we're going to be consistent, we should at least try and get through January before we start saying yes to giving out free parking spots to certain individuals because then what we're going to be into having to decide and pick between uh, one and another, and I don't think we should get into that. That's what we discussed, so I'm not going to support it. Yes, Lemon? Well, the problem is that the question is, you know, we would be inconsistent. Well, we're already inconsistent in terms of, I believe, we give out parking passes for one cultural establishment in the core area, and that is the art gallery. I believe that staff there get parking passes. Pardon? Volunteers. The volunteers as well. Mm -hmm. So we're already doing it, folks. This is not a slippery slope. It's one we've been on. And we've been doing it to the art gallery, and I support doing it to the art gallery and the volunteers. We've been doing that for years. And the uh, Roxy is a great asset to the downtown. It brings people downtown shopping. Uh, they go to restaurants and many other things, and I think this is something worthwhile supporting. Councillor Pruden? I think it's important uh, to also consider the context of the conversation at the uh, bylaw meeting. We had a presentation from Ali Boltman from the Roxy, who pointed out to us at the bylaw committee um, that many, many communities uh, support their cultural institutions and organizations. And she supplied us with a chart of comparative communities like ours who spend hundreds of thousands of dollars for cultural institutions directly from the municipalities. And um, she said, and, and where Own Sound was, was uh, basically zero dollars in direct support. I do know they get the, f they've, uh, applied for a facade improvement, so there are indirect ways and some monetary uh, ways. But um, the city has one of its five strategic areas of focus, cultural focus. So I think it was very important in this conversation, we weren't talking about not-for-profit organizations. We are talking about the city supporting a cultural organization in the city. Uh, and the request was for the volunteers to use space that's not used. It's a parking lot that has the ability to have 20 places filled. There are three permits sold. So the parking lot's empty. It's sitting there empty. It would be very helpful for the volunteers to be able to use space so they could uh, support the work of the Roxy. So I felt it was kind of the city putting its, um, just putting its way forward, demonstrating that they support cultural organizations. Uh, and the bylaw committee uh, members agreed with that at the meeting. So I'm a bit surprised that it's coming back now to have a whole discussion, but I think it's, it's a good discussion, so we'll talk about it and see. But I still feel very firmly that it's a demonstration of the city's support to one of its key strategic focus, and that's supporting culture. Any further comments? Councillor Chamberlain? Yes, and I would like to add my support to that motion because uh, with working on the downtown being a vibrant place, I think there's nothing that helps us more than 
I would right. consider the Roxy our partner in that. They put up the banners on Ninth Street. They, they bring people in for, I mean, it's a going concern. One, the presentation that I just attended recently about the new facade, they are making the back door of the Roxy be the entrance way, and they're planning on a walkway through so that and the, it'll be lit up at the back when it's open so that people coming from the parking lot at the back can actually walk right through the Roxy on a daily basis. A lot of that parking was, it will just say volunteers only, and it was for offloading some of their supplies they are 50 years old now, their building's 150, and they're celebrating, and it, it's a wonderful facade grant that they're working on. We've actually supported that. I, I can't, if we have a whole bunch of people asking us for parking, I don't think, I think we can handle every ask we get. I don't think it's a problem. Uh, Councillor Wright and then Councillor Boddy. Thank you very much. Uh, I uh, also am a member of the bylaw committee, and. This is the same discussion we had, and it was a fairly lengthy discussion because we all had the same thoughts. Uh, I certainly, uh, when they came, they requested five spots. Uh, we did not support five spots. That, uh, as has been mentioned, that's an area that is not being used for parking. It's sitting there. We've had pictures presented. It isn't being used. This is not a not-for-profit group in the sense of, of a not-for-profit. It is culture, and, and upon hearing that the Tom Thompson Art Gallery is, is receiving uh, space from the city for their volunteers whenever they request it, I could see no difference between them and, and the, uh, the theater, and, and so therefore I did support it then, and I will continue to support that tonight. Councillor Boddy. The art gallery is funded by the City of Owen Sound and always has been, and that's probably part of the reason. And uh, Council Beach sits empty most weekends except for uh, the third weekend in August, uh, which the Folk Society pays rent for when they come back and want that for free. What do we do then? Isn't that the same thing? Um, it, it is interesting that if it isn't uh, not for profit, is a concern that it's culture, that it's uh, Councillor Twaddle that's outside and it's Councillor Adair that gets to sit in the seat instead of uh, the other way around. That's funny how it works. Um, I, I still think it's a slippery slope and uh, will not be supporting it. No further discussion. There is a uh, motion on the floor. All those in favor? All those opposed, that motion is carried. If someone could uh, find Councillor Twaddle. Do we have to? The, uh, next item are the in-camera minutes, I believe. I had a Council subsequent motion, but I, believe, I don't believe Councillor Twaddle would be in a conflict, so I was, if we could wait. Short. Thank you. Councillor Twaddle. Sorry, I had a subsequent motion from our last discussion. I don't believe you're in conflict with. If oh, okay. I might. I'd ask the. I'd move that the bylaw committee um, take a look at the parking at the Scopas lot uh, and investigate the um, investigate the use of it as a as a monthly pass lot as well as a uh, allowing hourly parking in that lot. And I would suggest as soon as possible. I, I think I, I, Councillor Dares just said, uh, you know, discuss that in October. I think there's an opportunity there. We're, we heard at our last meeting that there's 20 spots and only three are used on a regular basis, and that the vast majority of the time during the day that lot sits empty. And I think that um, if there's an opportunity to generate money for parking with allowing by allowing hourly uh, or pay as you go. In, in, in there, uh, I think it should be investigated. So I would ask them to investigate that as, as soon as uh, practical. <coughs> All right, we have a motion. Is there any discussion? Carried.
Other business? 12. Oh, sorry. Yep, there we are. <coughs> minutes of, uh, uh, in-camera minutes of council for approval. There's two sets of minutes. Moved by Colleen. Colleen? <coughs> Councilor Purden. Any discussion? All in favor? Thank you. Now we're in other business. Councilor McManaman. Thank you, Worship. Uh, I had two items. The first one I think is fairly straightforward. We were asked uh, if we, if the if council would wanted to consider any delegations at the Good Roads Conference, and I'm wondering if we should request. I'm not sure if there's any. Uh, uh, usually, you would meet with government ministers. I'm not sure since the government is in transition if there'd be much point to that. But I certainly do think it might be uh, worthwhile to meet with uh, the leader of the official opposition and the leader of the third party. Currently, uh, Ms. Horvath and Mr. Hudak uh, request a meeting with them to discuss uh, small urban issues. Uh, depending on how the next election might go, who knows where they might be, and I, I think it would be useful to at least get our items uh, or, uh, on the table. So I request that um, that we formally request a meeting with Mr. Hudak and Ms. Horvath. <coughs> Ms. Corsi. Well, thank you. Um Councilor Twaddle, it's my understanding that we are in the process of trying to arrange those meetings. Um, they are arguably outside of the Good Roads Conference, um, and we are well past the date where we could have got delegations in any case. Thank you. I, I just um, should tell Council that uh, County Council has requested a meeting with uh, Minister Shirelli. Uh, with respect to the dredging of our harbor and uh, have requested that uh, uh, the report would be uh, put together by uh, the um, uh, economic development uh, and uh, tourism departments, both the county with the help from the city. And uh, just to inform you that the county is fully on board with getting that harbor dredged because it is of vital importance to the agricultural uh, industry in the county so uh, hopefully we will get a meeting with him and and hopefully he'll uh, join us in going after the uh, federal government to get that harbor dredged second item I'd, I'd make a motion that we request those two meetings so I, I'd, I'd move that <coughs> so not necessarily. It won't be through good roads. So. Oh, I, I believe Mr. Our MPP, Mr. Walker, had said that if we, uh, I, and, and I'm speaking out of turn perhaps, but I believe he had said he'd try and arrange meetings like that, and usually those are through, uh, do happen at events like good roads. So I, I think that would be an opportunity if, if it's possible. might not work. If it's possible, I think that's what we should uh, attempt. We have a motion to request meetings. Mr. Hudak and Ms. Horvath. All in favor? That's carried unanimously. Second item. Thank you. And I wanted to talk, or I wanted to uh, perhaps get uh, our Mr. McRoberts, our uh, Director of Operations, to discuss the recent snow event we had over the last uh, week or so. I know that's been a popular topic of conversation, uh, certainly <coughs> in social media and in the press. And I think it is important to. Uh, to discuss it here, and so those watching at home can can understand the response, the new policy. Um, we received a significant amount of snow, over 40 inches in about five days of snow, um, and I just ask, would ask Mr. McRoberts if he could discuss those efforts and in the context perhaps of our new policy. Uh, there seems to be some misunderstanding about the policy and how it affected this major snow event. So if you could uh, detail that, please. Uh, through you, Councillor Twaddle, I think um, certainly from a standpoint of this last storm event, it was significant in the, in the fact that we had, did have over 40 inches of snow over the matter of four or five days. Um, during that time, we did have all our resources basically out there. We were not basically 
uh, implementing the policy per se as it's basically written. Uh, we basically had all our resources out there. We're not holding back on any of our equipment or our manpower to basically respond to that storm. Um, to put the storm in some context, certainly uh, with 40 inches over the last, uh, over, the, over this five or six day period, um, it's interesting to note that the last time we had an event of that magnitude was in 2007, I believe it was February, uh, where we had a similar type of event that lasted about the same duration and, and had roughly about uh, 40, 40 inches of uh, snow. So very similar, 41 inches, pardon me. So very similar type of event, uh, similar responses to those events. Um, you know, it's unfortunate that uh, with the duration of that event and the type of cold temperatures we had, which were very unique to this event, uh, we had temperatures that were below uh, 12 degrees Celsius, minus 12 degrees Celsius, and as a result, that makes salt ineffective. So the use of salt does not provide us any sort of grace time, uh, which you usually give us an hour, and even sometimes two hours, to allow any snow that is falling to basically melt and not accumulate. So all the snow that was falling during that time with those extreme cold temperatures resulted in instant accumulation of snow and that created some havoc on some of our main streets. Uh, so that was uh, the focus, has always been and will continue to be our primary arterial and collector roads. From a policy standpoint, that has never changed. Um, certainly there were a lot of issues with respect to sidewalks and certainly from a standpoint of our response to sidewalks, our policy change has not been any different than any other year. Certainly where we look at is the policy becomes more applicable in those moderate to, to uh, light snow events where we will take, purposefully take time to respond to some snow accumulation on secondary streets. So if I might, uh, Mr. McRoberts, specifically about uh, the sidewalks, because of the um, duration and amount of snow that was received in that s short period of time, sometimes you have uh, blades on the front of the sidewalk plows, but with that amount you had to put uh, the snow blowers on. How does that affect the response? Uh, certainly, certainly two aspects of the event when it comes to sidewalks. Certainly um, when we have a light snowfall event and we don't have banks built up, we can use what we call our V-plow. That allows the equipment to operate probably in that sort of uh, seven to five to seven to eight miles per hour. Uh, when we get into using a snow blower, which is much slower, uh, we end up actually doing about three kilometers an hour. Uh, so significant difference in the rate that that equipment can move. Um, we're also challenged by the fact that as the snow is accumulating and we have our plows out basically trying to clear the roads, those plows will then in turn fill the sidewalks, particularly when we have curb side sidewalks. And so it makes it very challenging for us to be able to mobilize a sidewalk plow to clear a sidewalk before a street's been cleared. So we have to coordinate between those two activities to ensure that the street's been cleared first before we come in and move uh, the snow off the street. So there is a, certainly a delay process to that. We try to do it as quickly as we can with the equipment and the resources that we do have. If I might, uh, snow removal in the downtown is always a, a big discussion. I'm sure, sure we've all heard about it uh, on the main street, I'll call it. When would you, um, uh, when do you think we could deal with those snow banks? Uh, probably actually at this point in time, it's actually being removed tonight. Um, we did coordinate, it's a very, uh, very coordinated effort. We do use uh, outside trucks to basically come in and help us assist in that. But we have mobilized our staff and our equipment to proceed with removal of the snow in the, in the downtown core. And that's tonight and that'll be going on tonight throughout the evening. Well, that's certainly fast action to the, might be the fastest action to a question we've had at council in a while. Um, so I just want to <laughs> highlight the because th this has not been, uh, uh, you know, uh, councils as much at fault uh, as anyone, uh, has, hasn't been communicated as well as maybe it should have been. The changes to our policy, which, uh, which, uh, uh, well, there's no change to arterial roads or collector roads, uh, a snow removal and uh, snow plowing on those. There has been some uh, changes to secondary streets, but that policy is only for what I'll call a normal snowfall. Uh, you know, it snows and then the event's over. And, and it might be a few inches, it might be, depending on the amount, five or six inches even, but um, 
in a major event, a major snowstorm like we just had, if we experienced one of those in two weeks again, um, the policy doesn't really apply. We have all hands on deck type of uh, an event. Is that correct? Is that, if I characterize that right? That's, you've char characterized it correctly. And, and in fact, uh, I think we have given out uh, certain communication pieces out there, um, certainly interviews with the Sun-Times. Uh, there were interviews on both uh, Bayshore Broadcasting as well as the uh, 92.3, the dock, where basically I did indicate that the policy was not having an effect on our response and that we had full hands on deck and we were responding to the event with all equipment and resources available. I know that uh, the citizens out there uh, have been are, are frustrated by the amount of snow we've, we've received. I believe, uh, I think I speak for all of council when I say that uh, we're frustrated by, by it too, but we are, the amount that was received in such a short period of time makes it uh, extremely difficult uh, to deal with. And uh, we've received a lot of emails and a lot of phone calls. We all have. Um, but I think it's important to note that we, in a major snow event, we haven't changed anything. It's the exact same policy we've had in place for uh, since there's been a city. So um, anyway, I want to thank, uh, I know Mr. McRoberts, you've dealt with a lot of <coughs> Questions and concerns over the last week, and uh, probably you still have, probably still have a pile on your desk to deal with. So, um, I, I just think it's important. That's one thing we <laughs> need to always keep doing is communicate and keep communicating it because there are uh, people that don't understand the policy or don't, or perhaps we haven't fully uh, explained it to them. And I think it's important to keep uh, keep talking and keep the dialogue open. And uh, that's all. Thank you. S certainly from a from a staff perspective uh, we have been uh, we continue to monitor the event we will always look at opportunities for us to do everything that we do better um, so certainly all the information that we've been able to obtain either through feedback through residents resident complaints or concerns through inquiries through council or through inquiries with the rest of city staff we're certainly always looking for the opportunity to make the operation better um, that does not necessarily suggest that I'm I'm not suggesting that we would necessarily change the policy, just simply that we can always look for areas for improvement. I want to thank um, Councillor McManaman for bringing it up because it, it, it's just an ongoing community conversation with the snow and it's kind of a reasonable assumption that people put the big snow together with the change in the policy you know they're both out there at the same time and and really unfortunate I think probably for the operations folks out there on the plows as well that the big snow happened really was the first time to get out there uh, in a in a really big way because of all the <coughs> snow and in, in the public's mind everybody's got there's been a change in policy so that might be why things are um, you know my road is full of snow but I think as a community, we need to really come together. And I, I'd like to know how, you know, when we have these big snow events, because this could be our weather patterns now. Um, you know, nothing, rain, and then a huge dump. Um, how we're going to make sure that people can get out safely um, when you live on those secondary streets. Um, there were lots of people who were kind of stuck. And then when the plows did go by, they were even stuck more. Uh, so as a community, I think we have to figure that out. It's, it's not going to be the city that solves all these problems, but maybe we can help find ways and look at ways of, of making sure people are safe. Councillor Adair. Thank you, Councillor uh, Twaddle. I think all of our um, staff in the works department, particularly the crews who were out, need to be commended for, for um, their efforts. Uh, certainly, we had spoke about uh, or spoken about another issue um, last time about uh, communications and um, I know we have done some communication but I mean realistically um, Mr. McRoberts was busy trying to get rid of the snow <laughs> and so were so was everyone else in that department and and um, you know running off to uh, put out emails every 10 minutes takes you away from dealing with this event um, it's been a very strange couple of weeks, two weekends ago, it was plus 12 and raining and every last bit of snow that we'd had accumulated this winter was gone. And then suddenly it was minus 30 and never stopped snowing. It's now raining outside again. It's supposed to be up to plus 12 again tomorrow and, and rainy. Um, 
That's not normal. Um, I was just talking to Councillor Chamberlain beforehand. When I was growing up here, there were not wineries in Gray and Bruce County. It was not warm enough. There was not a long enough season to grow grapes for making wine, and now you can, uh, now you can do that. I think that we are going to have to get used to long, dry, open winters punctuated by crazy snow events. And I'm not sure how the city can respond to that any better than putting every piece of equipment and, and uh, man out on the road unless we are going to invest in even more equipment for that one event that might happen every, uh, every seven years, which would seem a pretty big uh, waste of resources. But um, it's, uh, it's been a crazy couple of, uh, couple of weeks, as I said, and I think our staff um, at all levels need to be commended for how they handled the, that event. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Dear. Councillor Lemon. Well, way back when, <laughs> we had the 40 plus inches of snow. Uh, on that particular occasion, I well remember the military had to come out from Base Meaford with their tracked vehicles to help us. Uh, part of the reason for that was the snow came in a more compact time than it did. But I think our staff did the best job. The reality is we live in a snow belt. We've been living in a snow belt since Owen Sound was Sydenham. And it's going to happen from time to time. And if you look at the occurrence of events, it's been many years since we had a dump like that. But every so often, they're going to happen. And the problem is we can't staff it and equip it just for those one in 20 year events or one in 25 year events. And what I think, uh, what I ha want to say is the staff did a good job. But remember, we live in a snow belt. That's the reality. And uh, the one thing that I always find interesting is if, for instance, Metro uh, had have gotten that amount of snow in that length of time, it would probably be declared a national emergency. Owen Sound, we deal with things and we solve problems. And I agree. We've got to listen to the public because they may have some ideas how we can make things better. But I think uh, our staff is to be commended. Uh, because they spent a lot of hours driving those trucks and there were no, to my knowledge, major incidents involving the trucks, which is amazing because of the cars that got stuck before <coughs> the plows got there. And uh, I think, you know, I'm, now this, a lot of the snow is going to disappear, but we may get it again. Who knows? Thank you. Councillor Chamberlain, your issue. Yes, my issue w is not really an issue. It's basically the other side of the snow story because I got on behalf of, uh, of council and the mayor to take congratulations to the Cub Pack in, who were camping out in Harrison Park, and it was their 50th year in a row. And when I got there, there was over 270 Cubs who had stayed in the snow overnight in, in their tents and their eagles that they had built and their human dog sleigh things. It was a really wonderful story because most of the people there were from southern Ontario and the states. And they were so happy that there was snow here because they had no <coughs> snow at home when they left to come to Own Sound. They said that the year before when they had been camping that it had been one of those rainy weekends like, it's, like it is tonight. So it was really very nice. It was also wonderful that Miamisburg was there and that's our sister, one of our sister cities. And, uh, that we gave a shout out to them, and we got to sing the American National Anthem. There was many, many wonderful things happening in our park. Again, Harrison Park is a shining example of where it's nice in the winter time, and I think you can get right around there without any problems at all in the snow. So I, I know it's the other side, but there is some good things that happen out of all the snow coming to own sound. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, on the other side of the season, um, economic development the last few years have looked at different projects and things, and uh, 
big question we always get is, why aren't we doing more with the harbor? Why aren't we doing more with boating? Why aren't we attracting boating? And uh, th this is an exciting summer. We've, we've talked and, and pushed the, uh, the uh, tall ships that are coming, and that's going to be pretty spectacular. We phoned a few people and sent a few letters and uh, from economic development, uh, Mr. Furness did, or, or actually the, the mayor, I guess, sent the letter. And uh, for the first time in many, many years, we have the Georgian Bay Regatta coming into On Sound. It'll start here, and it hasn't done that since, it goes back to Dragon Boat uh, race days. So that's gotta be 15 years ago, I would think, maybe, uh, maybe longer. Uh, it'll be starting here in July 28th uh, with the new owners of the Georgian Shores Marina. They'll be mostly staying there and at the Yacht Club. We hope they welcome into the harbor some of them. We'll be uh, leaving the race. We'll start uh, Sunday morning, July 28th, so they'll be coming in on Saturday the 27th. So the, uh, the uh, bright colored spinnakers, the white sails, there'll be approximately 40 boats in town from all over Georgian Bay. Uh, we're hoping to have a few entries from on sound um, uh, Wyerton uh, Lion's Head. It used to be that they did the east side of Georgian Bay and then the west side uh, from year to year, and they haven't been coming to this side for a number of different reasons. So th to me, this is pretty exciting. It's, uh, it's more action around our harbor. It's, it's more boaters. Once we get them here once, hopefully we can get them here again. Hopefully it's a, a tipping point. So if you're a busker, go down and hang around the harbor and busk. If you're a painter, go down and hang around the harbor and paint. Uh, if you're walking, go and walk around the harbor. Go and see what's going on. Let's get some enthusiasm. Let's get some things going on down there. Hopefully these two uh, events will start us off and get things going this summer. So uh, another excited uh, speaker, enthusiastic about what's going on and on sound tonight. Uh, maybe I'll be the last, but I'm, we're pretty thrilled with this. <laughs> Thanks. Let's do it again. Repeat the dates. It, it, um, Saturday, 27th of July, they're coming in. Sunday 28th, they're leaving here, and we'll be going up to White Cloud Island, up to Lion's Head, back down and around to uh, Wyatt, and then uh, ending in, um, in uh, Meaford in the following Saturday. We get that on our web? Kohler's item was withdrawn. Councillor Adair, it's your moment. Well, I'm, I'm very excited to uh, <laughs> acting worship to uh, move that the committee rise and report. <laughs> All in favor. <laughs> Resolution adopting proceedings in the committee of the whole. Moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Wright, that the actions taken in the committee of the whole in considering public meetings, deputations, public question period, matters Respondents, reports, matter, matters tabled, motions for which notice was previously given in other business be hereby confirmed by this council. All in favor? That's carried. <coughs> Thank you. There are no notices of motion, no resolution, no business by resolution. Bylaws, please. Moved by myself and seconded by Councillor Wright that the bylaw numbers 2013. 21 through 28 be hereby passed and enacted. Thank you very much. We are adjourned. <laughs>